Be careful when watching. In a world where there are dungeons with incredible artifacts that are every warrior's dream, obtaining just one of them will make you rich. These artifacts are so valuable that entire kingdoms devote all their efforts to acquire them. But all dungeons are guarded by unimaginable dangers. The more dangerous the place, the more valuable its magical artifacts, and the stronger its protectors. And that's where our story begins, with a group on a mission towards a very ancient and dangerous dungeon, where even the flowers near the site are traps with deadly poison. Poisons, so don't touch that. Stitch Atelier is one of the most experienced guys in discovering dungeons, and even for him, exploration missions are never easy. A knight from the kingdom hired a huge group to explore, and even after two weeks of intense travel, as soon as the group arrives at the dungeon they're about to enter, they didn't even have time to take a crap. Inside the dungeon, Atelier already shows why he's a veteran in this work. He reads the place, goes ahead, and points out to the unaware about the traps on the ceiling, also mentioning that, as they walked, he heard the sound of trap mechanisms that must be triggered by the wall. Atelier crafts mechanisms and disables all traps. They reach the heart of the dungeon, but to get through this area, defeat the local boss, and be happy. But how do we defeat the dungeon boss? The explorer throws a stone and makes noise, and the dungeon boss appears. They run in panic. The monster spews a jet of fire at the soldiers, but it's futile since the armor and shields have magical protection. The commander orders them to form a shield wall and advance to defend against the fire attack. They survive the attacks, then the commander asks Atelier to do something about it, so he shoots arrows into the monster's throat and brings it down. But hold on, it's not over. The commander orders them to stay focused. The protagonist is afraid of how resilient the monster is. Arrows alone are not enough. As our Atelier attempts to attack, the soldiers using shields are crushed. The protagonist swiftly dodges but ends up cornered by the dungeon boss. He was about to die, but before that, the soldiers execute a shield wall maneuver and save the explorer. In the monster's moment of distraction, the commander attacks from behind and hits the boss's face. The creature falls, and now it's the knight's turn to act. The man jumps, defeats the creature on the ground. They manage to defeat the final boss of the ancient dungeon, and now it's time for the soldier's reward. This battle left our veteran explorer impressed with this team. Satisfied with the work, everyone heads towards the room where the prize is. What interests them is not gold and jewels, it's the artifact in the deepest part of the dungeon, and there lies the dungeon artifact. Every Everyone is enchanted by the item's gleam. Unexpectedly, the knight asks Stetch Atelier if he wants to touch the item. Stetch Atelier is an experienced adventurer and knows that the dungeon artifact belongs to the expedition leader, but for some reason, he offers it to the hired explorer to be the first to have a chance to touch the expedition item. In the excitement of having this experience, Stetch Atelier goes fearlessly and touches the demon's ring in front of him. The knight leading the mission observes this happen. The veteran explorer didn't know or forgot that artifacts hold an enormous amount of negative energy, so the knight used him to discharge the ring so he could take it. Now he doesn't even need to pay dearly for the services and will already get rid of the explorer they would have to pay dearly for Stetch Atelier's service. Imagine being betrayed in such a way. The clever ones confirm that the artifact cursed has been deactivated and grab the ring, but something happens. The ring starts to merge with the dead explorer. It's a gruesome scene. The soldiers try, in panic, to attack what's in front of them, and it doesn't work. Whatever this ancient artifact is, it's too powerful. If they stay in this dungeon, surely everyone will die. They have to get out now, and all the expedition's efforts will be lost if they don't get the prize. At the last moment, the commander saves the life of the knight who didn't want to give up. They are teleported out of the dungeon and Stetch Atelier falls into the abyss. The protagonist surely died, but at that moment, the Memento Mortem artifact accepted Stetch Atelier as its partner. He emerges from the water instinctively and then opens his eyes. He had been holding it the whole time. No one has ever been so close to death as Stetch Atelier. He'd actually experienced the other side and now returned to the world of the living. When he realizes the relic that led him to death is now on his finger, he remembers well what happened minutes ago. It wasn't a dream. Last Stetch Atelier, my incompetent and companion. The knight and the commander who organized this exploration mission teleport out of the dungeon with a scroll. Unfortunately, they were the only ones to survive. All the other hired soldiers were buried in the collapsed dungeon. The worst part is that the honorable knight Gerald is the youngest prince of the kingdom, and he organized this expedition to obtain a legendary artifact in an attempt to improve his reputation in the realm. Soon the succession of the throne of the kingdom will take place, and he has just miserably failed. Because of this his reputation will be damaged. Commander Balstock 
explains to Prince Gerald that that artifact was not common, people believe that there are two types of artifacts, the independent ones being the most common, and the parasites. These merge with the owner of the relic and share its power. If the owner dies the relic is destroyed along with them. However, there is a third type, the symbiotic artifact, which are artifacts capable of reviving their owner by their own will, and it would be entirely possible that Stitch is still alive, so Balstock should spread posters in the cities with a relatively low reward, since a high reward would attract too much attention. Meanwhile, Stetch Atelier wakes up after falling into the abyss. He tries to understand how he came back to life, and then the artifact electrocutes Stetch. He discovers that he has merged with a unique artifact. In addition to being brought back to life, the artifact is conscious, and can converse with him. The demon's ring says its name is Memento Mortem. The ring says that Stetch Atelier is alive now thanks to its passive soul repair ability, which brought his soul back to life, but his body remains weak. Because of that brat, the great Memento Mortem is now without mana. Stetch Atelier tries to leave the cave and talks to his new partner. Stetch tells that relics usually have one ability, so what would Mementos be? Memento replies that if it were in its normal state, it would be capable of utilizing up to 40 abilities. Stetch Atelier is impressed, as the maximum number of abilities a human could utilize throughout their life is 10, so now he can have so many. Stetch asks which ability he can use now. Memento says none as it is without mana. For now, he will have to rely on his physical strength to escape this place. In addition, the relic tells him that he has another 12 hours of life until they both die if he doesn't recharge his mana. If Memento runs out of mana completely, the passive effect that keeps him alive will be deactivated. Stetch Atelier then questions that he wasn't really revived. Does that mean he is stuck with this artifact to stay alive? Several hours have passed since he was revived. The protagonist, motivated to stay alive, strives to the limit and finds the cave exit. Outside Memento says that before he was sleeping for centuries, even though he woke him up doesn't mean Stetch Atelier is his owner, he will only lend his powers for now. One of his abilities is to eat curses, with this he can absorb energy from other relics and mana from living creatures after defeating them. Stetch uses his instinct and notices footprints, and then the smell, it's a giant wolf and it will be his mana source. The explorer is weak and weaponless to face the creature. Memento advises him to use one of his abilities, the air shot, with the remaining mana he can use at least this ability without exhausting himself. His ring tells him to aim at the wolf and then the rest is up to him. Stetch does this and then the surprise. Sound of explosion. The blow is so intense that it disintegrates part of the wolf. Stetch wonders if this is a basic ability that uses little mana. Memento, proud of his power, affirms that he is not a simple artifact like the others, and it would also be better if Stetch didn't hesitate like a coward when using it. After these explanations, the protagonist decides to use the other ability. He looks at the wolf and activates curse eating. Stetch was betrayed by a prince of the kingdom. That same prince now knows that when he returns home to Venetian, his brothers will mock him for his failure. His brother already has priority to receive the family throne, and now, it has become even more difficult for him to have a chance. Now he will be seen as an idiot who tried to solve the kingdom's best dungeon, and caused the death of hundreds of kingdom soldiers as well. After absorbing the curse, Memento says it wasn't enough, but it was already enough to have absorbed that wolf. Stitch was deceived by those nobles of the royal family, who killed him. Now that he has been resurrected he needs to constantly hunt mana for his magic ring. For some this may be a curse, but for Stetch Atelier, it's an opportunity to seek revenge against those rich people. He goes to the city to pick up his things and some information by this time. Stetch was already being hunted for possessing the artifact and then he must become a fugitive. There is the city guard, very well protected by guards. He thinks about picking up some herbs and burning them. His trap was ready he puts the guards to sleep and sneaks into the city. Stetch finds out that besides being betrayed now, he is a criminal with a reward for his head. This makes him more irritated to remember the injustice he went through. After getting his equipment he doesn't know how much the news has spread, so it would be impossible to live in a village for now. The best option would be to leave the kingdom, but this didn't fit his style. It wasn't how he wanted to behave. Leaving the kingdom so obediently was out of the question. Memento asked if Stetch would like to get revenge, and the protagonist agrees, saying that unless he's a coward, anyone would choose revenge. The artifact laughs, and says it was finally getting more interesting with his partner having such noble intentions with revenge, he will have this help. His ring explains that his abilities depend on how much mana is absorbed and if he consumes something with a lot of mana, he will become much stronger. Stetch now knows the path he needs to take to become stronger and be able to eliminate the Gerald from the royal family. In a bar, a soldier asks someone named Dalton if there was any place selling quality leather at an affordable price. Dalton replies that there must be some kind of leather like that in the 
the black market, Dalton notices a familiar face he was taken by surprise to know that Stetch was wanted. Meanwhile, the protagonist is spying on some people coming in and out of the city and says that big cities like this always have back doors. Memento asks why he wants to enter this city as he thought Stetch would go straight to the dungeon when he heard him. However, the explorer calls the artifact dumb and says that an escaped scroll is essential when in a dungeon, saying that he will be massacred if he enters unequipped and unprepared. This is the same type of scroll that Gerald and his subordinate had used. He goes to the famous Black Market, a super secret place that few know the location of. He needs to knock on the door and say the secret code. Unfortunately, Stetch forgot what it was, but luckily the owner of the Black Market is his friend Dalton, and is very happy to see him again. They have a lot to talk about, and he asked if his friend would like a drink. Stetch rejects, but wants to use a table. He puts the wolf parts on the table. The explorer starts selling the claws, skin and other things. Stetch asks Dalton how much a scroll costs. Dalton says around 600 crowns, and is responded to by a request from Stetch. Wanting to borrow money, Dalton rejects the request, but that he doesn't buy a meal. Dalton asks what the hell he stole to be put on the wanted list. Stetch tells his tragic story, in the kingdom's most dangerous dungeon, and how the king's son betrayed him. Dalton explains that he doesn't have scrolls for that price, but knows a seller of stolen goods who could make a great price for a criminal. Just ask for Clyde and say that Dalton recommended him. Stetch approaches cautiously, and the old man is sleeping. He wakes him up very politely. The stench of this old man's breath can be felt from afar. His illegal products are on the table in front of him. Unfortunately for him, no one is buying anything. To the delight of the drunk dwarf, the explorer is going to buy one of his items. He needs a weapon that he can use in a cave dungeon. The old man shows a pistol, which is not suitable for use against many monsters. He sees other weapons, but none of them seem good. The vendor suggests a hammer, since he is in shape and has muscles. His choice is interrupted by Memento, who reminds the explorer that most dungeon passages are narrow, so such a big hammer is foolish. Startled, the protagonist tells Memento not to leave without his permission. Memento reveals that only Stetch is capable of seeing, hearing, and feeling its presence. With Memento's guidance, Stetch chooses a sword. In a dungeon, Stetch finds himself surrounded by various beasts, and he manages to knock out some without the help of the ring. But when he notices more presences, he points Memento to an entrance inhabited by monsters and launches an air bomb that devastates the monsters and then feeds on them with the curse eater. As he walks through the dungeon, he finds some rocks. With a pickaxe, Stetch begins to mine the azure stones and ends up encountering a trap. The boy said he could take advantage of valuable parts of it until he hears a scream in that direction. Pointing the ring to the location, Stetch tells Memento to illuminate, and then he is surprised by the sight, a giant mineral lizard. Which monster in dungeons is hostile? The creature shoots acid fire and hits his arm. Memento orders him to control himself and activates the recovery ability to regenerate his arm. Stetch knows the mineral lizards and explains that they use their acidic breath to eat minerals and strengthen their bodies using those minerals, so a normal attack would be ineffective. He prepares to launch an air bomb, but is prevented by Memento, who orders him not to shoot because he is in such a deep point of the dungeon that it could collapse with such magic. Now is the perfect chance for you to use that sword you bought. The explorer questions this decision, but is reprimanded again with his artifact saying that it would not be wise to hold on to it, and a medium-sized monster is the perfect guinea pig. Stetch draws the sword and advances toward the creature. He dodges an attack and moves above its head, where he thrusts his sword into its crystals. The artifact orders him to pull the trigger, and so it is done, killing the lizard. Using the curse eater, the creature's mana is devoured, and the boy laments about the sword's ammunition. Even though it was free, it seems like a big loss, as it is very rare, and there are only four left. Even though Clyde made them with higher durability, what would happen if they break? Interrupted by Memento, who says he feels something wrong, the boy focuses his attention on the artifact, which tells him to be careful and not to relax, until another scream is heard, another mineral lizard. Stetch complains about not wanting to spend another cylinder while advancing towards the creature, which tries to scratch him. Just narrowly, the boy dodged, seeing an opening in the creature, which he tries to attack, but is defended by the lizard, showing more experience than its predecessor, especially with its tail hindering him. But Stetch remembers that compared to the terrace, this monster is nothing. Advancing on him with the sword, he tries to cut him, but it is soon shown that this one was more resistant than the other, not being injured by the blow. The lizard punches Stetch, throwing him to the ground. Reprimanded again by Memento who says something is wrong with this lizard, the boy tries to remain optimistic, saying that as long as the monster is a living being, it still has a weakness, but being interrupted by the creature, holding his head and hitting against the wall, the boy is reprimanded again by his artifact, this time for having been distracted in the 
middle of a battle, but it turns out that it was already part of the boy's plan to be hit. He puts explosive powder in his left hand and firefly energy in his right, thus creating a light grenade, hitting an opening to attack the animal's mouth. But before hitting it, a warning appears. The cell activity was irregular, with 95% of the body being affected, so Stetch explodes. After a few seconds, Memento begins to regenerate him and says how he had ordered him to wait and the lizard being magically modified, meaning that someone was in the dungeon and modified it but does not know how it was done. The boy asks the artifact if any fighting monster could explode, but his doubt is answered with uncertainty of a maybe and questioning if he was scared. The explorer says he is not and will move forward finding the way, then activating the ability to find the way, but he doesn't detect anything, not even using animal instinct, until he finds a skeleton. Stetch says that they do not react except if they approach them, but as it seemed to have been here for a while, it is completely petrified. Memento says that this skeleton will explode if touched, so it would be better to ignore it. But as he passes the skeleton, its body rises, and the artifact orders him to run, because everything in the way is exploded. Stetch falls into a crater and asks what he should do if they explode even without him touching them, and the ring tells him to shut up, until the explorer notices various minerals and his greed takes over because with this amount, he would have money for the rest of his life. But when he touches the minerals, sparks start to come out, and Memento discovers what was bothering him all along, a strange mana filling the dungeon which Stetch was not able to sense, and the concentration of this energy was getting stronger every time they advanced, and the more they advance, the more sensitive and explosive monsters they found. Stetch understands and asks if the bodies had become unstable because of the mana, which is confirmed by the artifact, but not only the monsters were affected, every object in this dungeon was being influenced by this mana, and due to the high concentration of mana, also blocking the scroll, Stetch couldn't escape until defeating the thing emitting the mana to be able to flee. Walking for minutes, he finds the door of the dungeon guardian, where he deduces to be the one emitting the mana. Upon opening the door, he encounters a bizarre creature that even with his explorer intelligence was unable to comprehend, but Memento helps him, that's a genie, and that its center was the artifact. In this world, spirits are formed when mana and negative energy collide. They exist only to destroy their surroundings, as they have no consciousness, so they are closer to natural disasters than to a form of life. But how would there be an artifact in the midst of the spirit? Memento tells him that the guardian is the problem, as it merged with the artifact and was spreading mana in the dungeon, thus turning everything into living bombs. Stetch deduces that the answer is simple, defeat the boss. He advances towards the genie, who throws several blue stones at him, but they are deflected by his sword, until one of the stones would explode near him. Memento warns him that this is the part of the dungeon with the highest mana concentration, so the interference makes it even stronger, and at this rate, the sword and the boy's body would explode. After the blows, the boy faces the genie, who prepares energy in his artifact until the ring tells Stetch to run if he wants to live, unleashing a huge energy blast, which Stetch is able to dodge, then seeing an opening to attack the genie, who even though its body is a single boulder, its junctions are weak points, attacking then a stone, but something happens. The stone stops halfway and returns hitting his jaw. Stetch questions how he would cause damage to this thing, and Memento tells him to aim at the artifact in the core, because currently the core and the artifact are fused, so if he uses the curse eater on the core, it will lose all power. The genie prepares for another energy blast and Stetch for an air bullet. Both collide, but the genie's energy is stronger, forcing the boy to dodge, but the energy splits into several parts, which is dodged by the explorer, however, who is almost hit by the creature's fist, which he manages to dodge again. After realizing that long and short-range attacks were not enough, he advances on the monster piercing it with the sword and pressing the trigger, but it shows effective, but only a little, and the genie attacks him again. Stetch is hit and asks Memento why the air bullet wasn't enough to crush the stones, and the ring explains that it's because of mana interference. However, they are interrupted by more stones defended by the sword. The boy laments and compares the situation to breaking a stone with an egg, until the genie tries to attack his left with its fist, but Stetch says that if he can't overcome a small challenge like this, he wouldn't deserve to fulfill his revenge. Dodging the blow, Stetch realizes that if he continues targeting the core of the beast, he gradually reduces defenses and will be able to attack with Clyde's weapon, which was able to cause damage. The genie prepares another blow which is defended by Stetch who only has one cylinder left, that is, one chance to hit however. He notices something, the genie is trying to spin with this body. Even being warned by Memento of Stetch is hit by a stone, his artifact begins to try to heal him, and says it may not be the best time, but his body was reacting to mana, mutating, the boy just asks how long it would take for the mutation to be complete, and is answered that if he was in good condition, it would take a minute, which for Stetch, 
was more than enough, advancing with everything against the genie in a suicidal attack, shooting an air bullet at its core, which is the first attack to hit the genie. However, as the creature protected its core, it was difficult to hurt it, so Stetch stabs his sword into the core and explodes. But that's not enough. The genie prepares several stone stakes to hit the boy, warned by his artifact that he must move if he does not want to die. Stetch is refusing to die, until he realizes the usefulness of the azure ore he had collected before, exploding with the creature. Our protagonist finds himself very injured but on the bright side, the genie's core had been broken and he finally uses the curse eater on it and escapes the dungeon. After fleeing the dungeon, his body begins to recover with the mutation that was gone. Deciding to check his status, the boy notices that his animal instinct improved to level 7 and the curse eater to level 4. When he asks if Memento was awake, a pop-up appears, explaining that the artifact limit had increased from 100 to 150 and his air bullet ability had evolved into air explosion. As as well as two new abilities added, including Crosswind. Currently, the protagonist is in the process of unlocking Memento's hidden abilities, so the abilities will be unlocked after certain requirements are met. Opening a shop, where he has 8,305 mana stored, and in this shop, Stetch was able to buy two abilities, the Curse Aura and the Curse Devourer. The boy wonders which one to choose, but upon making his choice the ability was acquired. The next day, Stetch heads towards Clyde's house, where he hands him the sword and says he would like him to fix it as the weapon had saved his life several times. Clyde thanks him and starts to cry, saying he will fix it and make it stronger and more resistant. As a thank you, the boy leaves his dungeon spoils and his deposit of 3,000 crowns, asking if he could take some extra cylinders. At Dalton's bar, the bartender says Stetch was late, but he is questioned by the boy if he wasn't annoyed by breaking his main dungeon and assumes that the mine he had counted on must have worked well. Dalton says that black market deals were overflowing and asks if the boy would be interested. What is rejected by the explorer, who says he will sleep for a while. Now resting in a bed, the boy calls Memento, who says he feels dizzy. The boy asks if he didn't know anything until he activated the ability, which is assented by the artifact, which says it was reset the moment he met him, so most of his abilities were sealed and he realized something last night. The air bullet is a basic spell without an evolution tree, but it changed, taking on a new form, as if it had evolved into air explosion. A skill made out of the explorer's necessity, Stetch summarizes is Memento's speech by saying that he knew nothing about his future abilities, and then he just wants to sleep. After a night's sleep, Dalton wakes him up saying there is bad news, and going to the bar, he finds Clyde very injured, as if he had been beaten up. Startled the boy asks what happened, but Dalton just says one of his employees found him in an alley, while pouring a healing potion on the dwarf, who is healed. The explorer asks how much the potion cost, and the bartender avoids the question, saying it wasn't cheap. Clyde wakes up, and when asked what had happened, he says it had something to do with Derek's game. All the employees are disappointed, except Stetch, who doesn't know Derek, asking who he would be. Dalton tells him he was a troublemaker they let be because he doesn't cause any big trouble. But as once, Dalton had taught him a lesson for causing trouble to travelers, he must have tried to get back at the dwarf. Clyde completes Dalton's speech, saying he also heard about Stetch, when they were getting his money, saying that won't satisfy him, not until he reports Dalton's friend who has a reward and gets him arrested. This leaves the protagonist completely angry while the dwarf tells him to be careful. The explorer retorts telling him to focus on fixing the sword, and asks if he needs more money, while he leaves and tells them to put someone to protect Clyde. Memento teases his companion, asking if he was nervous, but he is told to shut up, as it's been a while since the boy hit people for no reason. The artifact asks if he will kill them, which is denied by Stetch, saying he won't kill everyone who made him angry, but they won't get away easily. Meanwhile, Derek was in front of guards, denouncing Stetch, but is quickly rejected by them, saying that Dalton is important to society, unlike him, so they won't search his bar right now, even with a report like that. As it would be rude, stressed, Derek returns to his friends, saying they told him to come back tomorrow. One of the members says the reward is nothing special, being only 400 crowns, and they already have money to relax for a long time, but Derek says he won't be satisfied just getting his money, so he wants Dalton to see his friend being thrown in jail, until they notice Stetch behind them. Derek says he was wondering how they could meet, but he was great grateful to go greet him, but the protagonist is so angry he says the gratitude is his, as it's been a while since he fought with another human, and was quite excited for easy targets to practice. One of the members holds his coat, but is met with a punch to the head. Stetch advances, giving a knee to the head of another gang member, while Derek says he was nothing but a miserable 400 crowns, trying to hit him with a punch. The protagonist dodges Derek's punch, and retaliates with a hook to his chin, asking what was the problem, and why hadn't he put him in jail yet. When Derek was close to 
passing out, Stetch pours a healing potion on his body, saying it wasn't time yet and he had messed with the last person he should have bothered. Memento comments that he loved his beer for having that personality, while the protagonist beats Derek even more. The next day, Dalton says he heard that Derek and his gang were walking completely beaten up this morning, and asks what Stetch had done last night, who answers saying he had only done exercises, but they are both interrupted by Clyde, who says he has improved and fixed the explorer's sword. Showing the sword, the dwarf says he added extra weight in the direction of the blade, and used some trap wires to increase the offensive capacity, leaving it quite destroyed even without a cylinder. But about the cylinders, he hadn't been able to find enough alchemists to work on it, so he had only gotten four, but as he knew Stetch wouldn't return to town for a while, he wrote down ingredients on this reference letter, which makes it so if he shows it to a specialist, he would be able to make the gas. Dalton also says he will notify the other branches of the black market about the boy, so he wouldn't have any problems accessing them. Stetch thanks them both, but before leaving he is interrupted by Clyde, who tells him to give a name to his weapon before going, as it was extremely unique. Memento suggests the name Penetrator, which is accepted by Stetch. Meanwhile, in the Venezia Kingdom, Gerald had returned home and was in his room until he heard someone knocking on the door. The prince instructs to ask who it is and his brother Alfred enters. Alfred asked him if it had been worth it, and Gerald says yes, but his brother says that's not what he heard, as he abandoned the front lines, led a stray squadron, excavated a dungeon without approval, and if his father found out, he would hold him responsible, but he tells him not to say a word when their father summons him, as he would provide an alibi. Upon entering the audience, the prince greets his father, who says he hasn't seen him in a long time, but without further ado, his brother begins to speak, recounting that when Gerald heard about the elven rebel army starting a revolt in the southwest, he rushed to suppress the rebellion before it could be notified. But General Endril says this was news to her because as the General of the West, why would they need Gerald to come all the way and suppress a rebellion? Alfred calls his servant Conrad and says his prediction artifact was able to see the situation, the terrain, and inform Gerald that at the moment of his return to the kingdom. Furthermore, the rebels had leaked their plans to invade a class a dungeon and steal the artifact belonging, and if Gerald didn't act correctly, the situation wouldn't end well. The kingdom asks Gerald what happened and Gerald says that except for Vice General Ballstock, the lead squadron was lost, but he was able to destroy the artifact. The king asks why destroy it, but is answered by the explanation of it being a parasitic type, so it would be better to destroy it than to leave it in enemy hands. Alfred adds that Gerald brought the head of the enemy general, which is shown as the head of an elf. Then the king accepts the prince's alibi, saying he should go rest. Meanwhile, Memento says he's noticing fewer signs of civilization the further south they go, and Stetch says it's because of the elves, as the last elf village in the great forest to the south was warned of the approach of outsiders, as they hated humans. The artifact says this means using abilities without Stetch being noticed, so being the perfect place to farm some dungeons. But it's rejected by the explorer, saying there are many rumors about how dangerous the elven nation is. Stetch walks through a forest so dense that he can't see much ahead of him. In this place, even his tracking ability doesn't work properly. Maybe that's why it's called the Forest of Darkness. Apparently, some magic is preventing it from functioning. Along his way, he finds a person crucified. He frees the stranger and tries to wake him up. Meanwhile, Memento tells Stetch that they should leave or they will be caught by the wild bubbles pursuing them. He notices pieces of bodies and deduces they must be the other people who tried to help before him. Stetch decides to use his air attack to clear a path and pass through. This can't harm these creatures, so he decides to use electricity magic. With the capacity of two car batteries, he fries all the creatures and dispels the curses. After escaping, he wakes up the lucky person whose butt he saved. The man, upon waking, thanks him and explains to Stetch what happened. He says the responsible ones were the elves, because who else would be eager to kill all the humans near the dark forest? The protagonist asks why the man ventured into this area if he knew the danger posed by the elves. The man justifies that he is part of a group of merchants heading to the capital and was forced to cross the forest to meet the deadline. His bad luck was being ambushed by several elves. Stetch was curious if the bodies in the wild bubbles were his companions, and unfortunately, they were. They died trying to save him. Moved by this story, Stetch says he will take the man to a point where he can find his way on his own. The man is surprised by such help. Using his instincts, Stetch realizes there is something strange about this place. Unlike a regular forest, the animal noises become more frightening as he advances. Ignoring these warnings, he manages to locate the forest exit. He guides the man named Patterson to the exit, instructing him to follow the path back to the road. Everything seems 
seems simple, but Memento and Stetch notice something wrong. He draws his sword and heads towards Patterson, saving the man as an arrow would have pierced deep into his back. The elves finally reveal themselves. A beautiful elf, excuse me, an elf orders Patterson to come with her. Stetch, on the other hand, refuses. The two elves become alert, and the beautiful elf says she won't give another warning. Her arrows will speak for her. Stetch calmly says he is not ignoring or bluffing, and if she wants to fight, then just fight. The subordinates with a look of hatred ask if they can kill him. Contrary to expectations, the beautiful woman says they should talk first before doing anything reckless. This attitude surprises our Avenger. Even the elf servants didn't understand this action from their leader Elena. She orders them to listen. The woman asks if Stetch knows why she wants this human. The explorer doesn't know, but he's sure she'll explain. The conversation is peaceful, so Patterson says he shouldn't listen to the elves. Elena asks Stetch what the man told him. After hearing it, the woman finds the story amusing and asks Stetch to follow her. Don't you think those curves are beautiful too? I am impressed. Stetch forces the man to follow as well. Upon arriving at a spot with an overturned cart, the direction was opposite to what the man had said before. Additionally, Elena goes to the river and retrieves the arm of one of Patterson's companions, who had a slaver's bracelet, indicating what the man intended to do in the elves' territory. Hearing the facts, Stetch now understands everything. Anger is visible on his face. The man's lies were clear. Checking the man's arm, he finds the same hidden bracelet. Patterson screams that Stetch shouldn't side with the elves. He is also human, and should understand that they are enemies. Despite seeking vengeance, our Avenger rewards the man with a punch in the mouth. Stetch orders him to shut up. Despite being so proud of being a slave trader, he hid it before. Our protagonist says that for him, there's no such thing as we are humans. Any despicable person of any race he will despise. Stetch asks Elena what they should do. She wants to hear his suggestion. The answer is visible in the human's fists. Stetch wants to make this person pay the ultimate price. Realizing it would be his end, Patterson risks everything, trying to escape. Within seconds, he receives an arrow in his arm. Elena then prepares and hits his leg to prevent further escape attempts. Stetch watches closely, noticing that the woman can hit a man fleeing at top speed effortlessly. After capturing their target, the man begs for mercy, promising never to sell slaves again. He even pleads for the explorer's help, but Stetch turns a deaf ear to his cries. His final pleas for mercy are directed at the elf. Unfortunately for him, a few minutes later, Elena is washing her blood-stained arrow. While cleaning her arrow, Elena comments that she didn't expect Stetch not to save his fellow human. She thought he would protect his own species. He regrets to inform her, but he's not the type of person she thinks. If that's the case, the beautiful woman says he must understand that she cannot let any human who invades the elf's forest escape alive. When the girl fires an arrow, Stetch is confident, and the reason is that the arrow was deflected. Elena quickly steps back, realizing that Stetch must be a powerful mage as she didn't see him casting a spell. Our villain activates recovery magic and crosswind magic. Elena notices an enchanted ring on the explorer's hand. She says she doesn't sense mana from him, so he's not a mage. They will spread out and attack separately until the mana for the ring is depleted. The elves use level 5 continuous shooting, which gives more precision when focusing on a single target. The attacks are useless against the explorer. Stetch asks why they bothered explaining everything to him before if they intended to kill him from the start. Elena simply didn't want Stetch to think elves are a race that kills without reason. He needed to know why he was going to die. Memento tells Stetch to stop wasting mana. The explorer now uses his sword skills to defend himself. It's easy since the arrows only aim at his head. Stetch, on the other hand, tells Memento he won't use mana because any of his abilities would kill the two elves. Even if his ring thinks its owner is weak for showing mercy to those trying to kill him, Stetch uses his attack only to intimidate the enemy elves. Taking advantage of an opening, he hits one of the elves hard in the teeth. It's unclear if the elf didn't lose them all. Elena asks if the ring is an artifact, and Stetch shows it to her without concern. The woman is stunned by this. She hates such things and attacks Stetch more fiercely than before. With a look of hatred, she says something so disgusting can exist. This is unexpected for our villain. He doesn't understand what she means but knows it's bad and about them. The beautiful elf takes advantage of this moment of distraction and moves to Stetch's blind spot. The woman is relentless and hits his chest. Now the scenario is two elves down, and our villain with a chest wound. Despite the pain, he is able to control himself and uses his recovery abilities. Elena sees this and, even without knowing it's a spell, notices the wound closing. She then makes more holes in Stetch. He sacrifices his arm to defend himself, knowing that despite the pain, he can heal later. Stetch now decides to retaliate against the elf. However, Elena can predict his intention and shoots his ring to prevent the attack. He didn't imagine it was possible for someone to foresee his attack and 
stop it with a simple arrow. Memento explains that before attacking, a large amount of mana gathers in front of him. She can sense the mana and predict it will be a powerful attack. Practically, it works this way, but one needs superhuman reflexes for this, so it's unlikely that Elena is an ordinary elf. Stetch agrees and advances with his sword, forcing her to retreat, but without giving her time to react, he advances again. He is repelled by Elena's arrows. Activating Crosswind, he repels the projectiles. Her strategy was to explode his head from a blind spot while staying cautious about the ring, but she's surprised when the protagonist hits her with a punch instead of using magic. Stetch tells her that feeling too many things is a bigger problem as she can't move while in the air, and he knocks her out with a headbutt. After hours, Stetch comments that he has never had trouble with an opponent since he took swordsmanship lessons. Elena wakes up, questioning what he aimed to achieve by entering the forest this way, but the boy tells her it has nothing to do with the elves and he didn't want to fight her, but she would pay dearly for trying to kill him. He takes Elena's bag and says he was only here for the dungeons. She was lucky to get out of this situation so easily. He steals a map from her and says he'll return it if he meets her again. Elena tries to make him stay, but Stetch ignores her. After a few minutes, he discovers that the dungeon is actually beneath a tree. Memento questions how he became an adventurer with such poor senses, and he explains that it's usually because trees don't grow close to dungeons due to the density of mana. Entering the dungeon, the boy is excited to explore it, trying to activate the pathfinding ability, but lacking experience with this type of dungeon, he uses animal instincts to achalocate, mapping the place through vibrations. Memento starts a conversation, asking when he became an adventurer. The boy says, he started at 12 and, if he wants to continue his lifestyle, he must be capable of handling situations like this. After descending into the dungeon, the protagonist becomes suspicious because, normally, something should appear at such a deep point, but they haven't seen anything. If there were monsters, he would hear their heartbeats. Then they come face to face with a gigantic tree, and Memento says they should have opened their mouth for something to happen. The explorer asks if it's a monster, but the artifact says it's a rigid root and advises against touching the other plants. Stetch realizes it's no surprise not hearing any heartbeats since nothing here has a heart. Understanding there's still a long way ahead, the boy advances through the dungeon, cutting and dodging vines pursuing him. Even though there are many, they're easy to handle, but when he opens his mouth, the vines trap him. Memento mocks this again. The root starts sucking his blood, but as it begins to hurt, the protagonist activates crosswind and decides to take the situation more seriously, casting a fireball spell that devastates the vines, while Memento reminds him to absorb everything he sees. After finishing the dungeon, new messages appear stating the artifact's mana grew from 150 to 250 and two new abilities were added, including reflective skin. However, Elena approaches from behind. By reflex, Stetch puts his sword to her neck. Elena says she's not there to fight. Suspicious, the protagonist asks if she wants a rematch and what brought her back to Nim. Was it the map? Surprisingly, Elena kneels and says she doesn't care about the map or anything else. She just wants her pendant back. Her companions are arrive later, but she puts them to sleep with punches to the chest when they notice the necklace in the human's hand. Elena, the beautiful elf, says she'll do anything to get her pendant back. Stetch says this is very naive of her, and if he were an evil human, he could take advantage in many ways. The girl seems unbothered and insists he's not evil since he saved Patterson, and then let him die after discovering he was a criminal. Stetch then questions why the pendant is so important to her. If it's precious, he will return it, but with one condition, she must help him avoid the elves while he searches for dungeons. If they encounter any, she must ensure they leave him alone. He even suggests he could pretend to be her slave or be taken for interrogation. Help avoid future battles with elves they might meet along the way. The elf then writes a letter to her unconscious companion, explaining she'll be away for a few days. If the elders ask, they should be told she's taking care of a distant area, and there's no need to worry. Elena remembers her past when the forest had been her home for as long as she could remember. Her grandmother, who took care of her, told many stories, always saying something about about humans. Humans are creatures whose greed stops at nothing until they get what they want. Among all the humans Elena had encountered, none gave her any reason to believe otherwise, until she met Stetch, who showed her something different from greed. Stetch confesses to Memento that this moment feels strange, prompting Memento to mock him, saying it would be even stranger if they talked as if nothing had happened. Given that they were about to kill each other just moments ago, Stetch tries to apologize for forcing her to follow him, but she interrupts, saying she isn't sure if he is 
is a bad person, but she also isn't sure if he's a good one either. She asks why he wants to clear all the dungeons here, since even if he seeks wealth and artifacts from the dungeons, it doesn't explain why a human would venture into the forest for that. Stetch replies that it's complicated and he isn't sure he could explain it to anyone before elaborating on his goal. Four days later, Stetch finds himself in a hole, tied up with a rope. He comments that it's not too deep for him to escape, but the design makes it really difficult, confirming that there truly are all kinds of dungeons out there. Hearing a noise, insect-type monsters appear and are easily defeated. Stetch asks if Elena is okay. Then they encounter a giant ant that attacks her. Elena dodges with a leaf, draws a scimitar, and injures the ant. Another ant is about to strike her, but Stetch notices and attacks the monster threatening the girl. He tells her to stay behind him as the ant attacks. The explorer uses his fire magic on them, his powerful attack roasting the ants. Elena feels the heat on her face and wonders, what kind of human is this? Had he been holding back on her before, he could have torched them all from the start. Moreover, how many spells can this guy use? This last question she asked out loud. Stetch responds that he's not sure, but it's definitely more than 10 spells. He says these ants are the first inhabitants of this type of dungeon. Their exterior is resistant to cuts, but not to being roasted. Elena notices that the explorer seems to absorb something from the defeated creatures, and asks if all artifacts have this capability. Obviously not, but for him, it's not so unusual. Elena explains that absorbing mana is inherently different from using it. This artifact being able to do something like this means it can access something more primordial and living beings, something like the soul. Stetch says that this artifact can indeed absorb the mana of monsters, but only from the dead. For him, this isn't something that harms people, so it's not a bad thing. These words don't seem entirely true to the elf, who finally says they should continue their journey. Now our Avenger becomes suspicious of the girl's words. Could Memento have access to his soul? It doesn't matter much since he's dead anyway. Reaching the deepest point of the dungeon, there are two entrances. The explorer asks the elf why it's so complicated, and she explains that the complexity of this dungeon is one of the reasons the elves have never been able to clear it. Stetch gets an idea and then drives his sword into the wall, activating his animal instinct, which makes him feel hundreds of ants, as if the entire dungeon were an anthill. Elena reinforces that this dungeon is so complex that no one has ever reached the end. The girl grabs the explorer by the neck and squeezes, but instead of what he expected, she covers them with a cloak that renders them invisible. The reason becomes clear as a gigantic ant appears, searching for them. Memento suggests to his owner that he follow the worker ants to where they are taking the eggs, as it will surely lead to the queen. Stetch admits to his ring that this is a smart idea, but when he tells Elena, she says that all such tactics have surely been tried by the elves before and won't work. While the girl disagreed with all of Stetch's ideas, Memento was responding to his owner, making it seem like they were communicating without seeing each other. Their strategy was to advance deeper into the dungeon, with Stetch throwing fireballs while under Elena's invisibility cloak, cutting down the ants that were attracted, and the girl using her arrows to dismantle the ant's limbs. After a long time of destroying everything in their path with their skills, Stetch activates his animal instinct and senses something nearby that is terrifying. Elena finds objects lost in the dungeon, belongings of elves that are cursed. They were likely left by those who died here trying to complete this dungeon. Because they are cursed, she can't return them to the families. Mimenda comments that it would be good for his companion to take these items, as he needs such things for the aura of curse. Stetch is unsure if Elena will let a human keep the elves' belongings. Even though it doesn't seem right, he decides to ask if he can keep them. The busty elf questions why he wants them, as cursed items can kill the person who uses them. She then says that if he believes they can be useful, he can take them. The protagonist puts the bracelets on his wrists, and says they can move forward now, his evil smile making it clear that the curses don't harm him. They continue until they find the queen of the place, likely the boss of this dungeon. Elena shoots arrows at the queen ant, which awakens all all the eggs in the area, reading an overwhelming number of ants to attack. More ants approach through the dungeon tunnels, irritating the adventure. The situation is now a complete disadvantage. His plan is to eliminate the queen first. As he launches fire attacks at the queen, other ants protect her from being roasted. This leaves the explorer with no alternative. Seeing how things are unfolding, he realizes his only option is to activate the curse aura of the items he picked up. Stetch uses an air attack to collapse the tunnels, preventing more ants from entering the queen's lair. Now it's it's just him and all the terrifying monsters inside. Activating his cursed items, it becomes unclear who the real monster is. Items exposed to dungeon energy for too long become cursed, causing adverse effects like physical problems and debuffs to the user. Most people want to avoid these items, but this doesn't apply to Memento Morton, the artifact that feeds on negative energies. Stetch orders Elena to stay behind him, 
and not move. He uses several items and sends a curse aura around, causing a debuff to all creatures around the explorer. All the ants kneel around him, including the queen. This effect also applies to Stetch, who kneels as well. Only Elena remains unaffected by the curse's negative effect, which surprises her. Stetch needs to maintain the effect on the creatures, making Elena responsible for killing the queen. Elena shoots two arrows directly at the queen, killing her. After that, the explorer releases the curse effect, and the other ants are ready to avenge their queen. Stetch grabs his elf companion and activates his electricity magic, killing all the worker ants in the area. The busty elf says she has never seen such a reckless human, but also admits she has never seen anyone who could clear a dungeon that the elves never could. The explorer absorbs the dungeon relic, the queen's heart, boosting his artifact stats and increasing his mana limit. Stetch takes the scroll that teleports them out of the dungeon and activates it. Three days later, our duo is in search of the next dungeon, the oldest and most dangerous dungeon in the elven territory, the Red Tree. The girl warns that they will die there, but Stetch says he is stronger than before, and everything will be fine. Memento warns his companion not to reveal the secret of his strength. Elena says the most dangerous part of the dungeon is the elves. The Red Tree dungeon is just past the elven village, and they won't be able to avoid them as they have been so far. Stetch must do everything the girl commands. Elena notices tracks on the ground, identifying them as deer tracks, but in reality, they are the tracks of Striders. She explains that Striders are the best scouts of the Black Forest Elves. Elena explains that they are not the type to leave tracks as they pass. She also says they probably wouldn't defeat the Explorer in a one-on-one -on -one fight, but if they come prepared to kill, he will die before discovering where the arrow came from. After a few minutes, Elena stops, saying it's strange because she can't hear any animals. Stetch uses his instincts and confirms this. The forest is completely silent nearby. When he activates his hostility detection ability, Elena is terrified. What she detected wasn't just hostility, it was murderous intent. As she tries to alert her partner, it's already too late. His body is shattered, his consciousness lost in seconds, and he falls lifeless to the ground. Elena is horrified by her partner's condition. She spots some elves lurking nearby, certainly the Striders. Perhaps Stetch will be the first first human to die twice in this lifetime. They emerge from the darkness and strike again with a warning arrow. When they reveal themselves, all I could think was, this girl is like a green-haired Hinata mixed with Kiba. I don't know, but our elf gets furious and protects her adventurer partner, questioning why they're attacking. The Striders return the question, why is Elena walking alongside a human? Their names are Jesper and Ida, and they both aim to eliminate every human who enters elf territory. Something they didn't expect was Elena opposing them and preventing them from ending the life of this man they just hit. The girl says they don't understand. This person is the only one who can defeat the Red Tree, so they have to go to that dungeon. They investigate the situation. Among the human's belongings, they find Elena's possessions. Jesper says she was blackmailed by this human. Elena should just give up becoming a strider. Hinata says they won't listen to excuses, but they'll take her to a council meeting. The protagonist who entered the forest to defeat the three famous dungeons of the region was captured by the elf protectors of the region and taken to the capital city of the elves. Jesper tells the girl she's been away from home for so long. She could at least smile now that she's back. Elena ignored his request and told him to shut up. Jesper didn't understand what was wrong with this human. He wasn't dying even with the bleeding. Elena asserts that once Jester understands how valuable this human can be, he wouldn't dare treat him like this. Jesper becomes furious hearing that he should respect a human. Hinata orders both of them to be quiet because one of the elders is coming to talk to them. The elf, whom we don't know if she's an old lady or a teenager, greets them, Strider Jesper and Strider Hinata and the relic protector Elena. It's good to see you. Elena was tense with the situation. The elder then asks why Jester brought this human to the city. Jester reveals that this is someone who stole the protector's relic and also blackmailed her with it. He brought him to be interrogated. The woman asks if he isn't already dead. They're not sure, but this human had a huge hole in his arm that can't be seen anymore. She orders him to be thrown into a cell for now. Elena must follow the elder. The girl wasn't happy with this situation, but she couldn't refuse an elder's request. The woman comments that the red tree dungeon is out of control and consuming all the elf forests. A week ago, an elf was dragged into the dungeon, bait because it's expanding to nearby areas. This is because of the parasitic nature of this dungeon. The elf village will only be able to contain it for a while longer. The woman then seems disappointed. While all this is happening with the forest, Elena had the relic stolen and also became his guide. All this she couldn't deny, and none of the elders will accept it without punishment. Sometime later, the darkness fades, and Stetch opens his eyes. Our villain wakes 
wakes up and a huge headache bothers him. Besides the deafening sound of thousands of elves screaming around him, he's in a stadium. Memento could only heal his partner's body but couldn't awaken his consciousness. Memento quickly explains what happened to his partner. Stetch was hit and was unconscious for four days until he healed. The elves locked him up all that time and today is his trial for his crimes and his public execution. The elder elf with a large bus orders silence and everyone respects her command. She says the human must speak. He entered the dark forest and stole the relic that protector Elena guarded. Is this true? The explorer could see Elena up high. Her appearance doesn't indicate she's happy with this situation. The human replies yes, that's true. At that moment, all the elves in the stadium shout aggressively. Now Stetch realizes that it wasn't something important only to Elena. The elder then asks if it's true that the explorer used this pendant to force Elena to guide him through the forest? This he also admits is true. The woman with a large bust then asks his goal with this. Is it to kidnap elves to serve as slaves? Stetch just directly says the truth as always. My goal here is to destroy all the dungeons in this place. This statement catches everyone off guard. Only Elena already knew about it. The elder then asks if this is true. How many soldiers did he bring? And what is the location of all of them? And how does he plan to feed so many people in elf territory? How skilled is their army? Our duo of undead responds that they have no allies. It's just him alone who defeats entire dungeons. This statement is an insult to the elder and all the elves who heard his words. She then orders Jester into the stadium to make the human tell the truth. The Strider comments that he should have told the truth from the beginning. Now it's too late. He was so quick that Stetch didn't defend himself from the punch in his stomach. He was out of breath and it was said that this was only the beginning. While the explorer was encouraged to tell the truth to them, the elder says that the accomplice Elena Drainwire is now allowed to speak. The first question is why Elena didn't call for reinforcements when she was robbed by him. Why did she let the human blackmail her? Elena actually didn't want her entire tribe to be held responsible for her protector's failure. But she didn't tell them that. Her response is that this human's actions in destroying the dungeons have proven useful to the elves. Elena says that even though she doesn't trust him, it's true that the human cleared the dry root dungeon and the anthill dungeon alone. The elder gets upset, saying that's impossible. Everyone knows that clearing a dungeon requires an army and months of preparation. While Stetch was getting beaten without fighting back, the elder claims that Elena should have confirmed it outside the forest. Surely, this human has a hidden army to have defeated those dungeons. Elena firmly says he doesn't have a hidden army or hidden supplies. Everything was done by her and that human together. Another elder questions why Elena is protecting this human and lying. Our elf says to the entire council that she's not lying and everything is true. Renata draws everyone's attention to the battlefield. That human isn't normal. All the spectators realize the same. That human has an incomprehensible aura. Stetch withstands more than his opponent's fists. He claims that Jasper will collapse before him. Elena then tells the elder that everyone knows the village is on the edge, and he's the solution they've been looking for. The girl reveals that he's someone who can absorb monsters and dungeon energy. Memento questions why Stetch hasn't used any abilities until now. It would have been very efficient here. The explorer says that in this situation, it would have worsened if he had caused a commotion. As if he were counting on his newly acquainted partner to handle this situation, the elder questions Elena, is the act of simply absorbing mana against the laws of nature. She will insist that this is true? Renata interrupts the conversation and advises releasing the monster. If this is true, they will know. Mentioning the monster brings concern to the elders. Renata is respectful and asks if Elena agrees that the explorer proves his abilities against the most powerful creature they know. She says that's perfect. Jester, upon hearing his name, surrenders and asks the explorer to calm down. As a gesture of peace, he frees his arms. The creature's roar shakes the entire stadium and Stetch's ears. Do they want him to go deaf today? There stood an armored bear before him. Stetch had never seen reports or records of a domesticated armored bear. So how were they keeping it in a cage? The elder thought it was an exaggeration, but Renata disagreed. If what Elena said was true, then this might not be enough. The elder with the large bust ordered him to demonstrate his abilities, and he understood they wanted him to fight that monster, but he wondered if they wouldn't give him his weapon. The protagonist realized his ring could hide beneath his skin. Memento made it so as not to draw attention and be separated from its owner, thinking the elves might have taken it. Stetch decided to use fireballs to see how the bear would react. The bear defended against the fireball with a single blow of its hand. This vile bear is truly impressive, our villain said. Stetch decided to use the blast of air. This attack was powerful, and yet the bear resisted, enduring the pressure of the blast, which was unbearable for all the other elves sitting in the auditorium. Soon, the bear was unscathed, which shocked him because his attack did and affected. The bear roared and attacked him, but the protagonist dodged the attack and used his electricity ability, which left the bear feeling dizzy. Renata asked Jester if he had given any artifacts to this human
human before. He hadn't done that, and they had taken all his objects. Volibear smelled like barbecue, which surprised the elders because they didn't expect that. Elena, on the other hand, was excited. Volibear still ready to attack, and Memento reminded Stetch that he was running out of mana. He knew that, but he found out that his electric type attacks were effective against the bear. The armored bear attacked him, and he avoided the attack using a wind boost. He jumped to Volibear's head and shot a fireball directly at the bear's face. Its head burned, and it screamed in pain. Our Avenger grabbed its tongue, forcibly opened its mouth, and grinned wickedly. Could it be that inside this fake Volibear is even weaker against electricity? After a thundering smash, Volibear was being absorbed by the human. They called him a monster because it went against the laws of the universe. The elder with the large bust ordered everyone to be silent. They must respect him now. Besides, what choice do they have now? The elder who doubted Elena before apologized for it. Our favorite elf then asked what they planned to do now. What else could they do? They had no choice but to let him clear the dungeon because that dungeon was a threat to them too. For the first time, they asked the human's name, and he answered. The elder stated that, to fulfill their request, he risked his life to demonstrate his abilities. But first, she wanted to ask why he initially took Elena's artifact. He explained that he didn't know it was an artifact, and had no intention of taking it from her because he wanted to challenge the red tree. With a serious look, the elder said that if he wants it so much, they won't stop him. However, they won't support him with anything other than basic supplies. Stetch feels like this woman doesn't like him. Elena says she wanted to go with him, but the elder didn't allow it. She tried to persuade her because the Red Tree dungeon was on another level compared to the other dungeons, and no matter how strong he was, sending him alone was risky. However, the Elder repeated her words. She still needed to take responsibility for losing the artifact. Memento says that basically, they don't want to send their precious elf to a dangerous dungeon. I think they're right. What about you guys? Elena really wanted to help but they didn't let her. Since she was so worried about him, Stetch asked if she had forgotten that his artifact got stronger every time he cleared a dungeon. He said he's not as weak as the elves think. He doesn't plan to die. The elf elder ordered to return his equipment and asked if he needed any supplies. Stetch replied that some potions would help. Meanwhile, Near the dungeon, the Striders tried to stop the Roots from crossing the border they had created. Their captain aimed at the Roots and commanded his colleagues to block them at all costs. Before he could avoid it, the Roots captured him, wrapping around his body like in those weird animes you might imagine. An explosion freed the captain, and they celebrated that help had arrived. To the surprise of the elves, it was a human who was there to help. The captain asked what happened. Why is there a human so deep in the dark forest? Renata warned not to dare touch that human. If anyone did, she would cut off their peepee. -pee. The captain asked Jester why two striders were accompanying a human. Jester replied that he didn't know, but the elder's order said he was probably their last and only hope against that dungeon. The protagonist burned all the roots outside and waved to them saying he's going now, pointy ears. Meanwhile, in the elf village, Elena asked her grandmother why she stopped her. The old lady with a teenage face replied that she would never send her to the red tree. Elena's grandmother only had Elena after her Nora and her son died because of the red tree. Elena is her only granddaughter and living family. But the girl was worried about her people dying, and if their frontline soldier lost, not only would all the elves be wiped out, but the entire forest would turn into a dungeon. Wouldn't it be better to support him as much as possible? Her grandmother didn't agree with her. Is Elena their best chance? Not for her grandmother. She already lost her son, and going to the red tree wouldn't improve anything, only increase the chances of losing her last family. Elena wanted to disagree once again, but her grandmother wouldn't allow it because this is not up for debate. No matter how strong that human is, if he dies, they won't have problems. What the elves need to do is come up with a plan B. The elder with a sad look said he can't be compared with Kane. At least this human can buy some more time for the elves. Meanwhile, in the Red Tree Dungeon, elf skeletons were scattered everywhere. The atmosphere of the dungeon was quite intense from the start. The protagonist agreed, as he could almost smell the blood in the air, which was a bit worse than in the first dungeon. He examined the area and found dungeon plants, so he asked his artifact if it knew anything about these plants. Memento was surprised to see where the protagonist had reached, as his ability to find a way didn't work in the first dungeon. He drew his sword and attacked the roots with his sword. When he released the gas cylinder, it caused an explosion that broke the ground. He descended and replied that its effect was a sinkhole, as he found some underground plants. He recognized them as familiar and smelled an unbearable odor. He approached the flower and saw an elf inside it, completely dehydrated. Memento couldn't feel any life from that elf, considering the foul smell coming from the room. He assumed that everything in that place was probably
probably elves. Some roots attacked from behind, and he cut those roots with his sword. They didn't let him interrupt their meal, but he also didn't plan to let them eat peacefully. He removed all the living elves from those sacks, and tried to wake one of them up. As he kept screaming, Stetch slapped him to calm down and be quiet. Here. Why you bully me? You fucking bitch, why you bully me? He shouldn't be afraid of those plants. He gave him an escape scroll and instructed him to use it to leave as soon as everyone woke up because he had to go now. The elf grabbed his shirt and asked him to wait because they had to save someone who was the only reason they were still alive. He didn't want to leave without that person, Cain Drainwar. And speaking of the devil, Cain regained consciousness and wondered if they still hadn't had enough. He's at his limit now. Someone destroyed the wall in front of him, a human carrying an elf boy. The elf was happy and confirmed that was Cain. Stetch was amazed to see those disgusting things. He ran to Cain and explained that it might hurt a bit, but he should bear with it. The other elf asked to be gentler with them, and in a few seconds, the elf boy was the one who should be gentle as he carried Cain out of the dungeon. After they got out, our Avenger asked if it was Drainwar. Is it really who he thinks? Memento says yes and is not sure about letting that weak elf take this important person. Stetch asserts that he can feel the owner of this dungeon behind that wall, and that he's eager to get his hands on Stetch. Cain is safe now. The protagonist did what he's used to doing to get into places and destroyed everything in front. In this place he found what he expected, a giant and terribly strange creature. He didn't know that disgusting plants like this could exist. The tree began to move its branches towards him when he asked if it had any information about the dungeon guardian. It was a subspecies of the world tree, probably of the same species as the tree growing over the dungeon. It was so imbued with mana that he couldn't even discern what it should have originally been, and now it was just an abomination. Stetch was impressed to see that the tree was coiling its vines to defend itself, showing to be semi-sentient. He attacked the tree with a fireball, but a wall of blood appeared to protect it. He was worried because that monster was very cunning, and none of his attacks were having any effect. He assumed that electric attacks wouldn't work either since it was a tree. That made sense because the guardian had been at the top of the food chain of the dark forest for centuries, so it wouldn't be easily defeated. It probably wasn't the first time it captured a mage so powerful and absorbed his mana. The protagonist attacked the tree with his sword, commenting that the person was a mage, but was blocked and severely injured by the vines. Even with passive abilities helping, he ended up being captured. Stetch drank a healing potion to preserve mana and threw the tube at the monster's head, warning it not to get cocky for being a bunch of mana. He was then shocked to see the tree, laughing at him and wondered why a disgusting monster ignored the basic instinct of the guardian to protect the dungeon. He realized that the tree's influence went beyond the normal limits of a dungeon because there were no other monsters, only carnivorous plants. It even had a mechanism to capture and store future nutrients, indicating that it had an ego. The more he looked at the tree, the more disgusting it seemed. Using wind magic, he managed to escape and became furious. Stetch challenged the tree to attack him again, promising to kill it, even if it was the last thing he did. The monster became enraged and attacked, and he avoided all the attacks using his dancer skills. After dodging the attack several times, he was surprised to see that a plant could be provoked. He noticed that the tree was struggling to cut its vines into smaller and thinner pieces. Stetch honestly said that there was something he wanted to try against the armored bear, but couldn't because of the many people watching. A combination of fireball and air blast, creating a storm of flames. The tree tried to protect itself with its vines, but still got hit. The heat of the atmosphere made Stetch sweat. Memento instructed him to unleash as many attacks as possible while he had the chance, so he ran towards the tree. He used electricity magic on the vines attacking him from behind. Memento began to find his partner very confident. Does he have a plan in mind? Stetch said to look closer. The tree's body was made of solid and rough vines, but there was a part that seemed particularly important. He approached the tree's face and punched it, making his hand penetrate deeply into the tree's throat. He used a curse aura on it, knowing that alone wouldn't be enough, so his artifact asked him to do something else. He remembered Gerald and used his desire for revenge as motivation. He activated his curse devouring ability to absorb the cursed items he took from the elves before and were in his fist. With this, he reinforced his fireball ability into Darkness Inferno. A fireball turned into a hell, emitting high-temperature flames and incinerating the target. Outside the dungeon, two elders and Elena went to the entrance of the dungeon to inquire about the current state of the dungeon and if they knew if the human was dead or alive. There was no way to find out at that moment. It had been a while since he entered, but there were no abnormal activities. The elder said it was her turn to try to suppress this dungeon. Captain Nazir panicked at the intention of Elder Bellinora entering the dungeon. The man advised her not to be hasty. To everyone's surprise, suddenly some elves appeared, and he instructed his people not to shoot at them and to lower their bows. Jester was surprised to see that they were the missing elves and ordered them to be moved to a safe place. The elders, a 
Elena and Captain Nazir were shocked to see these people, especially that Kane Drainwar was alive. Elena ran fiercely towards her father. They wondered if the human was responsible for this. Kane opened his eyes, and the girls cried with happiness to see that he was really alive. The elf asked Captain Nazir to send reinforcements to the dungeon, explaining that a strange human had entered alone and saved them. They received his escape scroll, but as powerful as it was, it was impossible for a human to leave alive, so he pleaded for help. Then a strong wind came out of the dungeon, and a lot of dust, shocking them. Elder Belinara shouted that they must all go help the human right away. Jester and Renata prepared to go, and then the unexpected happened. The human teleported with a scroll out of the dungeon, and it collapsed. Stetch was talking to his hand when he realized he had a big audience in front of him. Everyone was shocked to see the human alive, and their attention turned to him. They were happy because the red tree had been eliminated, and he saved them all, making them free. While a hero emerged among the elves, Gerald wanted to leave as soon as the soldiers arrived. He asked Ballstock to wait and take care of some things for him, which surprised him. He handed him a letter and instructed him to look at it because it was a new dungeon that a spy in the kingdom of Galia had discovered and sent to him. He wanted him to take care of it, so Gerald instructed him to choose some people from his elite guard and get the artifact as soon as possible. The dungeon was technically in Gallant territory, which could cause international conflict, so he had to be careful and not get caught. He understood his task, and the prince decided to go first to the northern border, meeting him there after finishing at the dungeon. Meanwhile, Stetch was leaving the forest with Elena. He told her that he wasn't racist, but wouldn't it be dangerous to go to a human village with those pointy ears or face painting? She asked him not to worry because as long as she had those marks, she would look like a regular human to others, although it was useless for those who already knew her identity. Stetch was surprised, wondering if it was some secret technique of the elves, but he wasn't so surprised since they could even detect dungeon formations. He remembered that Kane explained to him that certain mana-sensitive elves, like his family, could see the mana flow. Sometimes mana concentrates at a point so densely that they can't even look directly at it, and that's when a dungeon forms. The protagonist understood that he meant that a dungeon had just formed, and he confirmed it. Memento was happy because there would be no one to interfere, but that had been the situation for some time, so they needed to clear it before others found out. Elena was ready for them to leave, as she would go with him. He thought she was too old-fashioned, as no one else repays the village's debt. Memento thought she would be useful, as an elf's ability was really useful. The protagonist agreed, maybe because she used to be a strider, she's fantastic, as elven mobility is a powerful archer and even detects dungeons. Elena wanted to know why they were going in that direction. He explained that a small village was ahead of them. They would rest there before traveling for another week. After covering some distance, they spotted the town, and he instructed her to stay behind him all the time, even though she looked human. Memento questioned why the explorer was so confident. Doesn't he have a bounty on his head? Stetch believed that was nonsense. They would never recognize him since he wasn't even wearing the same clothes. Memento now doesn't know if his partner is an idiot or not. They reached the entrance of the village, and the guard asked for his name while looking at the wanted list. He replied that he was Ryan Gosling. When asked the woman's name, Elena thought about Stetch lying and also did the same. It's Selena Gomez. The guard looked at them suspiciously but soon gave them the permission plate and instructed them not to lose the permission and have a good day. Stetch was impressed with Selena Gomez's cleverness. She then asked why lie. She did it, but still doesn't know why. Memento questioned if he's an idiot. He never told her that he was currently wanted. He asked her to enter the hotel first, where he would explain the whole situation. The bar was quite noisy, with people talking loudly. Compared to the forest, this place is much worse. He offered her a drink to try. Selena Gomez took a sip but immediately spat it out because it tasted bitter and unpleasant, similar to dirty water. Memento had to agree with the elf. He didn't understand why humans drank that. Stetch sighed and decided to talk to her about the matter. He explained the whole situation while they ate, and she was surprised to learn that, in the end, he even received a reward because of it. He stated it was her choice and allowed her to return to the forest if she didn't want to help him with revenge. However, Elena found his desire for revenge reasonable and remembered his words in the forest. She would have to be a hypocrite or an idiot to stop him. He had even saved all the elves from extinction, so she said that in the name of the Drainwar, she would pay her debt. Our protagonist felt strange remembering Elena's parents, who supported their daughter going on a journey without knowing what it was about. Elena commented that getting revenge on the king was not an easy task, although Stetch was probably someone who could do it. She asked about his ring, and Stetch instructed her to be quiet for a second, as some customers were talking about having the king's soldiers on all the roads and land, because many people had been robbed there. Elena soon realized this would be a problem since the soldiers would be patrolling the roads, and they had no idea what was hidden in the forest. So, 
So, she wanted to know what Atelier's plan was. Some time later, the soldiers were gathering people planning to travel the trade road. There had been many incidents recently, so they sent soldiers to solve the problem. Merchants with money to hire mercenaries for security would pair up with poorer merchants who couldn't. The protagonist saw an advantage in this situation and decided to find someone to take advantage of. He approached one of the merchants and asked if they could accompany him. The man replied that he was already poor and accompanying someone else. But he should ask that man over there, whose name was Farquaad Filch, a famous merchant. Stetch didn't need to look much to know that this guy was a pain in the neck. He asked merchant Farquaad to let them accompany him too. But he got furious, as he had already said he would only take his own people and no one else. The man just commented that people around were watching him act. So the famous merchant changed his stance and asked if they were at least adventurous. When they said yes, Farquaad allowed them to join as well, which was easier than Stetch expected. On the way, our Avenger talked to his benefactor, who replied that he was a dungeon explorer. The man was surprised and said he had also wanted to be an adventurer or explorer, but got an arrow in the knee from a goblin when he was young and couldn't follow that career. Elena, as a true warrior, was always alert to find something strange, as Stetch asked her to stay vigilant for any danger. At night, while resting, she said that nothing seemed out of the ordinary yet and hoped it would stay that way. They were startled to see one of their companions fall and wondered what was happening. They were dazed as the mana particles had already dispersed. Stitch couldn't foresee this and also passed out. She ran to avoid these particles, knowing that everyone would fall if they continued. Hidden in the bushes, she saw some people around the merchant and wondered if they were the robbers. The thieves were annoyed by having so many mercenaries for defense. They were probably important people and must have valuable things. The thief asked asked the boss if they would take everything, but he refused, as the target was Farquaad Filch, and not to touch anyone else. They were surprised to realize that one of the targets was awake. Stetch was still moving after the mana dispersion. They all attacked simultaneously to incapacitate the threat. The protagonist was furious at them for using magic to rob and attack in a group. He began to use all his taijutsu to knock them out. After defeating two thieves, the others were terrified of him resisting the spell. The reason for this is that our protagonist had acquired a passive of skill, magic resistance level 1, reducing negative effects by 20%. Memento explained that it wasn't just a passive skill, but their connection was getting stronger, making him a superior human being. Stetch didn't like how it sounded, but Memento said he did. The thieves called their boss, asking him to do something about it, but he was surprised to see someone resisting his spell. He didn't even know it was possible, and asked his companion what was happening. Shale was also confused, as there was nothing wrong with his ability, but the opponent was strange. He he was furious and asked who he was, why he wasn't affected by the spell, and if he was a mercenary. Stetch wasn't a mercenary, but witnessing a robbery, he couldn't stand idly by. Those few words were enough for the thieves leader, so the man decided to end the game. He suddenly disappeared and reappeared behind Stetch, kicking him directly in the face. He was hit, and to Stetch's surprise, he couldn't figure out how he did it. Stetch tried to talk, but the thief only communicated through violence. Another kick was precise on his nose. Perhaps Stetch wouldn't be able to stay calm conscious even resisting the sleep spell. The thieves leader asked Shale if he had lost his talent for magic, as this guy was a weakling who resisted his spell. The short man asked if he preferred to cast the spell himself if he could. The thieves leader proposed something unusual for his companion. He wanted to take this man with him. While the thieves were against it, Elena was in the trees watching the situation unfold. She was sure he had disappeared for a few seconds, so she wondered if this thief was normal. She didn't know why they were taking Stetch but had no choice but to follow them. On the way, Memento was furious with his incompetent partner, who had been passing out too often recently. Stetch always let his guard down against other humans. He asked what he should do against someone who disappeared. Memento was trying to convince him that Stetch should fight alongside him in these cases. So, why didn't Mr. Floating Skull show up and do something? The conversation with an invisible being was interrupted when the man placed a mug of hot drink on the table as a sign of peace. Stetch, on the other hand, was irritated and questioned why the thief was letting his guard down now. He apologized and introduced himself. His name was Garrett and wanted Stetch to become his companion. He called himself a great patriot who loved this kingdom. He was the leader of the honorable bandits who served the people. Stetch thought that whoever could be a patriot in this crappy kingdom introduced himself too, saying his name was Brian. He asked if Garrett thought he was stupid. Why would he join a group of bandits? Garrett was taken aback by this aggression, then insisted that they were an honorable criminal group, only robbing the rich to give to the poor. However, for a stetch, a bandit is always a bandit. 
Garrett's soldiers couldn't believe this man wanted to join them. Rob and Garrett reminded his companions of their origins. Bernard was a beggar and was now a valuable member, and the shy shale was a garden gnome and now a powerful wizard of the group. Garrett pounded the table to say that he made this happen. He had a good eye for finding diamonds in the rough. Something unexpected passed by the man's ears and made a small cut. All the torches were hit at a terrifying speed, and then they screamed that they were being ambushed. But what army would be hiding in the forest without making any noise? For a stretch, it was obvious that it was Selena Gomez. While they were distracted, he had the chance to escape and ran. Selena whispered for Brian Gosling to come in this direction, and then joined him. Stetch wanted to know how many guards she killed, but Selena said she didn't kill anyone unless necessary. They were all just unconscious. To the couple's surprise, someone appeared in their path and looked too tired for it to be easy for him to intercept them. Garrett didn't want to let him go since he failed to convince him and asked if he knew what would happen now. He was frustrated and wanted him to stop being persistent, as he had tolerated him enough. Garrett ran towards them to attack, but they attacked first. They were surprised to hit the void. Selena Gomez and Brian Gosling still didn't understand how it was possible. Thanks to Memento warning Stetch that his stomach was the target, he managed to block the attack and then moved away from Garrett. The thief hinted by asking if Brian could see anything. Memento told Stetch that the artifact on his shoulder allowed the man to travel in the spiritual and physical realms, making him like a ghost. To the human eye, he was invisible, but to the eyes of a superior being, he couldn't hide. Shao reached the three who were fighting. Garrett tried several times to hit Stetch, but failed and was even struck by the fists of vengeance. It must have hurt a lot, judging by his face. Brian shouted for Selena Gomez to act now. She threw daggers and almost managed to hit the ghost. Shale couldn't believe how that guy reacted to his boss's movements. It shouldn't be something a human could see. Stetch almost managed to knock out some of Robin Hood's teeth. Even with his ghostly ability, Garrett struggled in the fight. Shale was sure the man's movements were improving during the fight, so he decided to help him and used magic on Stetch. But Elena threw a stone at him and stopped him. Besides singing, Selena was excellent at aiming. She didn't want him to interfere, and all the other thieves attacked her to capture her, but she used her strong wind ability. They didn't know she could use magical abilities and were pushed by the wind pressure. Garrett was worried about their critical situation. Soon, Merchant Farquaad arrived with his men and ordered them to attack everyone. Stetch Gosling was happy to see the reinforcements but was speechless when he ordered them to attack everyone. They ran to attack while Stetch raised his hands in peace, but those idiots didn't realize it due to the darkness that allies were fighting before they arrived. So he had no choice and drew his sword to defeat the mercenaries as well. Shale soon woke up and asked what had happened. His boss was worried and asked if he was okay. He didn't know why, but their location was exposed by the people they robbed that morning. The most surprising thing was that they brought reinforcements, and one of them was a giant brute that weapons had no effect on. The only thing they hadn't tried against him was magic, so they asked Shale if he could handle him. He tried to use his drag magic, which reduced the target's movement speed by 30%. His magic failed because the man wore a cloak of magic resistance. His boss realized they were determined to get them that day. He couldn't believe they had gotten such expensive equipment. He took his dagger and ordered Shale to help the other men. Garrett disappeared and instantly was on the giant Robocop's shoulders. He tried to hit the head but struck the helmet. Before he could try again, Robocop used his arms and hit him from an impossible angle. For his arms in that position to make sense, he would have to be a rubber man. After that, he was thrown to kiss the ground. The punch he was about to receive would be fatal, but the giant felt things heating up. Stetch cast his fire magic on the giant to stop him. Such powerful magic made Garrett's hair stand on end. Even with a protective magic cape, the giant could not nullify the fire's effect. Memento commented to his partner that this was a joke. An inferior magic item couldn't block his incredible spells. Stetch had to acknowledge that his partner was excited about this. After Stetch gave the giant a a breath of fresh air, the titan attacked him with all his might for revenge. Such slow attacks were no threat to a veteran explorer with hacks. He even remembered that Valbear was much stronger and faster. This giant was like an open book, so predictable. He hit the guy's butt, and then Elena emerged from the trees and applied a choke hold on the giant. Despite her seductive appearance, Elena was like a heavy missile and buried the giant in the ground with great force, enough to defeat him. Garrett stood up smiling, saying Brian was playing hard to get. He wanted to join the incredible band of honorable thieves. Stetch had to hold back from smashing the guy's head too. He justified that he didn't like the Venezia royal family, so he would help defeat them. With his scariest magic, he made all the soldiers feel what it was like to be struck by lightning. Everyone on the battlefield was astonished by this magic. Something like that was terrible.
terrifying. The mercenaries gave up resisting, and soon everyone was defeated. After being tied up, Farquaad cursed Stetch for being with those thieves all the time, using it to say that one shouldn't associate with commoners. Stetch made it clear that Farquaad had put him in this situation when he attacked him. Garrett interrupted and wanted to know how Farquaad tracked his camp. The merchant didn't want to reveal his secrets, but it was enough for Garrett to suspect it might be a tracking medallion among the stolen treasures. Shale put the man to sleep while saying that's why Garrett should let him handle the merchandise. This is what happens when he grabs everything without knowledge. Satisfied with the interrogation, Garrett offered a water bottle to his new ally and commented that Brian seemed to resent them. Did he have some history with the royal family? Stetch said he wasn't wrong, but as for Garrett, what was his goal with this man? Was it a scam? Garrett stated that the royal family had been corrupted for a long time, using the fear of neighboring kingdoms to amass an absurd fortune by taking money from citizens and allies. This is why Garrett acts. He can't see his country act this way. This guy is one of the main lobbyists of Venezia. He sends military funds to the northern borders to avoid paying taxes in Venezia. Garrett repeated that he doesn't steal from just anyone. Stetch whispered that he had similar goals, but Garrett's methods took too long to affect Venezia. With everything cleared up now, Brian Gosling asked if he could leave or if Robin Hood would try to recruit him again. Since Brian wasn't planning to reveal their plans to anyone, he wouldn't do anything. So Garrett shouted commands to his allies, and they would leave in an hour. This was a goodbye, but Garrett hoped it was a see you later. Our protagonist smiled, thinking he didn't want to be associated with thieves again. But if fate willed it, they would meet again. After leaving the group of bandits, they walked for a while and arrived at a dungeon, confirming that Elena could detect dungeons. This one looked so clean and elegant, perhaps newly formed. They entered the dungeon, and Stetch could light the way with a fire ability. Elena noticed a monster hiding ahead. Stetch asked if Elena had fought goblins before. She had seen them a few times in the forest. He didn't know about the goblins she encountered in the forest, but those in dungeons were treacherous. He would show her how they hunted their prey. He located traps set by these dwarves and disarmed them. After doing so, he said they got very angry when prey didn't fall into the traps and attack that way. Stetch also showed how they were great at catching fire. With his barbecue magic, he set them all on fire and then absorbed the mana from the creatures. Elena felt sorry for the little ones for a moment. Maybe the real monster was the adventurer who fought like a ninja and cast spells like Gandalf. Inside this dungeon, another group was exploring the place. A girl named Millie wore a pendant that guided them in the right direction, and they progressed while guiding others, the Ballstock Special Forces. Millie guided the group and told them to stop. Something was wrong. This trap had been disarmed. It might be a monster with intelligence, but it was likely the work of a human. Raymond now realized they hadn't encountered monsters yet, which was improbable. Emmerich, despite not seeming intelligent, deduced that someone must be here. What they found further ahead confirmed this theory. A goblin barbecue pile. Millie was sure there couldn't be a flaming monster in this dungeon. It was the work of an explorer. Returning to the goblin barbecue responsible, progress was easy for the duo. They finally reached the dungeon boss's lair. Upon opening the door, they encountered a giant creature with ten eyes. You can see nine, but one is hidden. Tired of fighting giant creatures, Stetch was quickly attacked by the monster. With his agility, he dodged and used his arc ability to discharge electricity throughout the giant monster's body. The sound of this fight and the giant monster echoed throughout the dungeon. Even the ball stock group could hear it. As they approached the origin of the noise, they saw the colossal and frightening creature facing something even more frightening. What would Millie do? In the boss arena, Elena used her agility to shoot arrows stealthily at the creature's eyes. Stetch continued charging the boss's battery, but like an iPhone, it never got full. Millie ordered Raymond to get ready. The man questioned if it was serious. His leader's silence indicated it was. While Stetch struggled to defeat the boss, Raymond prepared an arrow reinforced with precision magic. His target was a fatal spot to defeat the biggest obstacle in the dungeon, the rival explorer. It's impossible for anyone to dodge, but to their surprise, the explorer evaded the attack without even looking in their direction. Raymond's heart sank as Stetch was now looking at him. For a few seconds, Raymond's ally managed to save him from becoming a barbecue like the goblins they had found earlier. They were safe now, but that didn't mean it would stay that way. Stetch might not have hit them, but next time they wouldn't be so lucky. He asked if they weren't going to lie and say they didn't realize he was human. He felt the killing intent in that arrow. Raymond was paralyzed while processing the information. This guy had just fired a fireball. Surely he was the one who defeated the goblins alone. He was dangerous 
dangerous. Stetch was very irritated. The guy wouldn't answer his questions? Wouldn't try to convince him to spare his life? That wasn't the case. The sound of electricity echoed through the corridors. Emmerich arrived in time once again to protect his ally. However, even being the group's tank, he couldn't resist the attack he blocked. Memento warned that the shield was a magical tool that redirected magical energy. Emmerich, while feeling his body paralyzed, could only think that this mage was not normal. While the two men dealt with one monster, the other monster was like a porcupine, roaring in pain. Elena then went to ask who these humans were. Stetch didn't know. He only knew they weren't on the same side. Elena suggested they finish them off first and she would help. Stetch thanked her for doing so and kicked them away with great force. Something made him think he didn't want to eliminate other humans. For Elena, that wasn't a problem. The elf shot to be fatal. Millie intervened and blocked all the arrows. This was unexpected for our exploring duo. The red-haired girl used a whip sword and took advantage of the distraction to capture Stetch with her weapon. Emmerich quickly hit him like a train. Raymond used this moment to try to hit the fatal arrow on his target. Stetch, furious at these humans attacking him, broke free and destroyed Millie's sword and repelled the arrow. Raymond failed once again and narrowly dodged Elena's arrows. In this scenario, they were at a disadvantage. That woman was also dangerous. Stetch tried once again to ask who they were and why they were attacking him, but got no response from the rival group. Memento said they wouldn't give information to targets. They were undoubtedly trained professionals. Stetch pondered if that person had sent them to eliminate him. No, these people must be after the treasure of this place. Place. Millie, while staring at her enemy, told Raymond and Emmerich to attack the man, and she would handle the woman who attacked from a distance. To complicate the couple's situation, the boss positioned itself behind Stetch and Elena. They would have to face three people on one side and the boss on the other. Millie attacked Elena fiercely, and she was able to defend with her wooden bow. At the same time, the boss focused on attacking our beautiful elf. Channeling fire in its giant mouth, it attacked the girls. Stetch, near the spot, fought the two men while worrying about his exploration partner's safety. Emmerich, despite being a tank, also had weapons to attack, forcing Stetch to retreat further. This time our protagonist tried to use his wind bullet magic and hit the shield directly, but couldn't get past Emmerich's defense. Raymond, with his precision magic, still couldn't hit Stetch effectively. Even two against one, the two men were cornered against this mage. The person before them was accustomed to fighting in dungeons. Elena, nearby, resisted all attacks against her and left Millie in the same situation as her. The giant creature now approached from behind Millie, and Elena took this moment to stealthily go behind Millie. Her kick was blocked by the girl. Elena warned that she didn't only know how to fight from a distance, she could also handle close combat. Millie and Elena exchanged punches, and the two girls seemed to have the same level of close combat, their attacks like mirrors hitting each other equally. The fight went beyond fists, each using their equipment and maneuvers to try to defeat the other. Millie then positioned herself on top of the boss to see the battlefield. Elena was furious with her, but her biggest problem was Stetch defeating her allies and about to cast a big spell. Millie shouted for Emmerich to stop him, but Stetch anticipated things. He used two spells simultaneously, Air Explosion and Crosswind to affect everyone on the battlefield. He shouted for Elena to hit the two men. Raymond was about to go blind but narrowly dodged, the injury being just a scratch. He escaped safely from this attack, but Millie was hit by the mage's spell. Emmerich had nothing to do, so he began to absorb Stetch's magic into Millie's body. Our protagonist didn't care about them and decided to focus on the boss now. Stetch jumped on the multi-eyed creature and used his exploding sword. Within seconds, the creature's head was in pieces, and the explorer was absorbing the creature's energy. Now it was just him and Elena against those three wounded adventurers. Stetch asked Elena to go to the other side to get the artifact. He would finish these three. Elena wanted to make sure Stetch needed to go that far with these people, saying they would be buried when the dungeon collapsed after they got the artifact. In a dark tone, Stetch asked if he had ever told her why he survived that time. He was alive only because Gerald let his guard down. Our Avenger wouldn't make the same mistake. He was about to finish the three, and then Emmerich used a smoke bomb that filled the area. They were willing to risk everything to be the first to get the artifact. Emmerich ran to where Elena was, and Raymond took his last chance to hit the target. A red silhouette, and someone received a fatal arrow. Unfortunately for Raymond, Elena wouldn't forgive so many times those who tried to take her partner's life. In the smoke, Stetch couldn't act. Elena eliminated one of the men and quickly reached the other. Selena Gomez used a movement ability to overtake Emmerich. She also threw some presents at him that stuck to his arm. Stetch finally came out of the smoke and focused focused on reaching the artifact before any of them. That could be something unique, and they had to be the first to lay hands on it. Emmerich couldn't beat either of them in speed. His last attempt would be to stop the mage.
mage from reaching it. Stetch was tired of how many times this person blocked his spells. Now he had no shield to do that. He told him to block this now and fired. The fireball hit the mark. Emmerich felt his skin peel with the heat. His last moments were seeing those two reach the dungeon artifact. He wouldn't be able to complete his mission or survive today. As soon as the artifact was removed, the dungeon collapsed on them. Outside, our duo used a teleport scroll and were safe. This made Stetch furious. Why were those people so desperate to get that artifact that they even sacrificed their lives to try to get it? Elena remembered Raymond shouting to leave them behind and get the artifact. So what was so special about this bracelet? Secretly, Stetch asked Memento's evaluation of this item. The ghost skull said his partner must be stupid. This item was from a newly formed dungeon. It couldn't be anything. Hurry and give it to him to devour. Stetch thought about Memento's words and decided it was nonsense. He must be jealous and decided to put the item on. He reflected that he hadn't tried any of the artifacts they had taken until now because Memento had eaten them. This time he would at least try. It was surprising. Information on how to use it blossomed in his mind as if he always knew how. The name was Barak. Memento was angry, asking how his partner dared to use other artifacts when he already already had Memento. Furthermore, when an artifact bonds with its user, Memento can no longer absorb it. Despite the scolding, our protagonist didn't care. Barak was now logged into the explorer Stetch Atelier. Selena Drainwar asked if Stetch wasn't going to absorb it this time. Stetch then picked up a stone to test its effect. By enchanting the object with his artifact, it became more powerful. He explained to Elena that it was like the enchanted item was a magical tool. Stetch said he felt that the stronger he got, the more artifacts he could possess. This made Memento Memento angrier, as his partner was using other artifacts besides him. It was betrayal. Some time later, they encountered a man who was waiting for them. Stetch and Elena were to stay under his care. Elena began to realize that her partner was someone with good connections. Soon, they set off while he looked at the map. He instructed her that if they continued heading north from where they were, there would be a mountain range called Rakasha and one of the largest mining cities on the continent called Sentigma. That was where they were headed. But something didn't make sense. The city he mentioned was in the opposite direction, but their guide insisted they had to do something first. It's difficult to enter Sentigma. Antigma because of its tight security, so they needed an alternate route. The reason he was placing those stones along with the money was to pay the toll. The merchant warned that they were quite lucky because it's increasingly rare to find people like him willing to take this route. Now, they could hide in the wagon. When Elena climbed up and showed her beautiful legs, for some reason, Stetch's cheeks turned red. During the hours on the road, he had to control himself so nothing would go out of hand. And of course, they passed through security without the merchant having to show the wagon's goods. When they arrived, the merchant showed them the city and advised them to go to the bars first to gather information about the place. They went to a bar where the owner had heard a lot about Stetch through Dalton. His name was Baltazar. He would have loved to welcome the two, but they arrived at the worst possible time. Naturally, Stetch was curious to know more about this, while Elena was once again hating that terrible thing humans like to drink. Baltazar revealed that there had been more monster incidents around the mines in recent days, so all the kingdom's soldiers gathered to subdue the area. Baltazar suggested that if Stetch had any sense, he wouldn't go to the surface and draw attention, since his head was valuable. Our protagonist was not happy with his situation and made it clear that he did not intend to stay in the city for long. His interest was in the black market smiths and alchemists. When would they arrive in the city? Baltazar, surprised by the question, said the kid didn't really understand the situation. Because of the subjugation, there were hundreds of soldiers in the city, and for that reason, all the blacksmiths were involved with orders for the army. Stetch, then furious, realized he couldn't get what he came for in this city now. Baltazar explained that even though army services didn't pay as well, in times like these, they helped make the city's area safer, so they took all the army's orders. Stetch shouted that he had a lot of money. Wasn't there any greedy blacksmith who could be introduced to him now? Given its importance, Baltazar said he would try to find someone for him. A few days later, Stetch was crying at the bar table. He had so much money and gems, but no one wanted to accept them. Wasn't his adventure and revenge more important than protecting the city and its inhabitants' lives? Elena then came over to thank him for the human clothes he had gotten for her. One might say our protagonist's sadness would disappear right away. But before that, Baltazar came to him with good news. He had found two people to help him, and to start, Stetch could buy them a drink. Before his eyes, Stetch saw Hope, a blacksmith and an alchemist. They were Casper, the alchemist, and Letty, the blacksmith with strange muscles. They greeted each other, and Casper made it clear that the situation wasn't 
good. Everyone had dozens of orders to fulfill, but as a favor to Baltazar, he would prioritize Stetch. And here we see once again the advantages of having good contacts. Casper wanted to hear what the explorer needed so they could decide if it was possible. Stetch showed his sword, which he'd been using, made by a friend from another city. The two had never seen anything like it before. Before even touching the sword, they said it wasn't something that could be easily fixed. Letty inspected the item and was surprised by the quality of the sword. She also explained that the gas recipe used to activate it wasn't something easily obtained anywhere in the kingdom. Therefore, she suggested replacing the gas in the cylinders with gunpowder. Casper confirmed it would have more firepower and be easier to reload than gas, but it would be much more expensive. Stetch then smiled and showed his heavy gold coins, and because of that, he also wanted to request defensive equipment made of leather. Casper commented that leather equipment might also be difficult to obtain at a time like this and asked Letty if she could do something about it. The blacksmith said yes, but he had to provide the leather to be used since all the city's raw materials were used for the army. Some time later, Stetch was using 100% of his brain to figure out where to get leather. Baltazar mocked our hero because all the monsters near the city were stone types and had no leather to be harvested. Stetch then, in a moment of madness, asked if the monster Baltazar mentioned yesterday was a stone type too. With a serious look, the man said he didn't have direct information about that. But judging by the wounds of those who survived, it must be a beast type creature. Baltazar then explained that the army came to the city because no one could defeat this creature. Stetch's intention was obvious to everyone, but he said he wouldn't do anything stupid. It was just curiosity. Baltazar, a man who understood that men like to face dangers, the small scar on his face proved it, told Stetch that the man over there was an informant from the black market. If he wanted to find out how to encounter the creature, he could tell him. The brave soldier woke from his dreams when Stetch banged the table with a gift for him. He asked about the monster incident in the mines. The soldier was furious because that wasn't something he could tell a stranger who might spread gossip later. Stetch said he didn't want to spread rumors. He just wanted to know about the moment they were attacked. This made the man even angrier. He vented that it was true. He was the soldier who fled instead of fighting. Did the kid have a problem with that? Baltazar quickly stepped in to knock some sense into the soldier using the best way possible. He said it was obvious the man should have fled since he was a precious source of information for the black market. The informant revealed that the monster in the mines was a manticore, which was strange to Stetch. This creature typically appeared in the deserts of Caldet. Why did it come to the Raksha Mountains? The informant recounted that they were excavating a wall in the mine, and when it broke, the creature emerged for the first time. He was sure the monster had bat wings and a scorpion tail. Upon hearing this description, Description. Stetch was mesmerized. This was the perfect leather for his equipment. The soldier could hardly hold his reward for the information. The gold was very heavy. Stetch thanked him and revealed that he was going to hunt the creature. The man's advice was to give up. That thing couldn't be defeated even by a powerful group of adventurers. Only the army might succeed. He tried to return the money, insisting he couldn't accept it for a young man to go and lose his life in that place. Stetch, in turn, said he wasn't just a pretty face. He was much stronger than he seemed. To demonstrate, straight. Since it was a manticore, it should be weak against this. He then fired a small attack, perfectly hitting a candle on a nearby table. The bag of gold had already been taken again, and the soldier asked if the young man was a mage. Stetch said he wasn't. Did he have a problem with that? The man didn't, but he wanted to ask a favor of the young man. Later, Stetch and Elena arrived at the mines using the secret route the man had informed them of. They went through the sewers and now smelled like a public bathroom. Upon seeing the entrance, Stetch could already imagine what the monster had done inside. After seeing the condition of the entrance, he used his animal instinct to track the monster. The smell of rotting flesh pierced his nostrils, and he cursed because his sense of smell was very sensitive, but he needed to endure it. The hardened trails in the mud led only in one direction, and he thought the area around was safe. He was exploring the place when Elena called out after seeing a severed arm, wondering if it belonged to the soldier's comrade. The informant had asked them to bring back mementos of his dead comrades, so Elena collected the belongings from the bodies to take back back to him and moved on. The creature was prowling the area. Stetch asked Memento if he knew anything about the monster, if it had any weaknesses or something, since that was his specialty. Memento explained that manticores had thick skin, so most weapons couldn't pierce it, and they were also resistant to magic. Stetch even asked if it was unfair for it to be resistant to both physical and magical damage. But it still had a weakness. The inner parts of its wings were thin and particularly vulnerable to physical attacks. They reached a place where they saw more bones and blood, assuming much more was happening there, wondering if the manticores 
Lloyd did that too. Memento affirmed that there was nothing else around that could have done that, and Stetch couldn't disagree. But why? Suddenly, they heard a tremendous roar that scared them. Memento was sure it had detected Stetch, and was waiting for him to approach its territory. As nervous as he was now, Stetch wasn't going to back down. Elena then said the monster couldn't be that big of a deal. The eight hours of terror training she did with her grandmother was much worse. Memento and Stetch, for a moment, wondered who this woman was. Our explorer calmed himself and slapped his face to regain focus, then began to prepare as Batman would in this situation. He was going to lure the creature, and Elena would stay here to provide support at the right time. Stetch trusted Elena completely, and said it was time to greet this creature. He said this while enchanting a dagger with his new artifact. Inside, he searched for the monster but found its egg instead. They were surprised because a manticore must be at least 50 years old to lay an egg, so it was rare to see something like this. Stetch assumed he wouldn't need to worry about money for a while if he could get his hands on that egg. But for a moment, he thought he was too addicted to his work. His focus was revenge. The monster took advantage of his distraction and almost swallowed Stetch's head whole, ending the manwa. Luckily, Stetch was quicker and didn't die a second time. The creature still didn't give up and nearly hit him with its long scorpion tail, which he blocked with his dagger. His weapon got wet with the acid from the venom. If that got on him, it would be a problem. Memento stated that the creature used its egg as bait because it knew it was very resilient and they wouldn't be able to harm it. Stetch didn't need to think much and decided the best thing to do was run, so he did. The creature roared furiously at him. How the hell did this coward decide to flee so quickly? As if challenging Stetch, the monster roared again. Our protagonist accepted the challenge and tried to use his fire and lightning magic simultaneously, covering the manticore's entire body with it. Then Memento warned him to be careful. The monster's tail almost hit him again, and this time it launched poisonous stingers. Stetch continued to run and throw magical attacks to lure it, and despite the high magical defense, the manticore felt some effect from the magic. It also kept launching stingers, which Stetch defended against. The creature then started receiving multiple arrow attacks, which also didn't affect its thick skin. After some time, the creature reached the trap and got stuck in the wire he had placed in the tunnel. Stetch then threw as many fireballs as he could, and Elena shot all the arrows she could. He shouted to add even more power because the creature was going to give in, but that didn't happen. The manticore, feeling cornered, roared so loudly that the attacks were dispersed. The duo now had to face the monster head on. Determined to win, Stetch approached while Elena provided support. The monster covered its eyes to avoid being hit, so Stetch climbed even higher to hit directly on the wings. The stealth attack was effective, and now the monster decided to fight back. It hit him with its head, smashing him against the cave wall. He was injured and spat blood, worrying Elena, who could only shout for him and hope he would respond that he was okay. Stetch used recovery magic, and Memento reminded reminded him that it wasn't effective. This magic only restored the body's health but didn't heal open wounds, injured organs, or broken bones. Stitch knew this and said it was worth the effort. That dagger was exactly where he wanted it, and now he just had to use it. He attacked the manticore with electricity magic, and this time the electric arc had a significant effect on the monster, its scream of pain echoing throughout the underground. This made him very happy. His plan was working. The thick skin was resistant on the outside, but the sword made the electricity enter the body and damaged the monster from within. Even though he had the advantage, the creature's resistance was so great that it was still holding on. With a roar of desperation, the monster nearly deafened everyone to disperse the attacks on it, then tried to use this moment to strike its vile stinger and defeat the insolent human. Stetch and Memento synchronized and used an air explosion magic to disperse the creature's attack, avoiding the stinger and the acid it also released. The creature also tried to attack with its claws, and Elena was alert to take advantage of any mistakes to blind the monster. The monster also realized the archer was the easiest threat to eliminate, and decided to attack with its tail. Elena, confident in not being noticed, was almost severely hit. Stetch, with sharp eyes, anticipated the monster's movements, and saved the future mother of his children. The tail was very annoying and dangerous. Because of this, Stetch warned her to stay away and just hide for now. He was was sure the mantico was taking damage from the electric attacks, so why was it still standing? Memento agreed it was effective, but Stetch needed to land a critical hit to knock it out. The explorer missed his explosive sword. With it, he could blow it up through that hole, but unfortunately, the item had been left behind for repairs. With no choice, he concentrated everything on making even stronger electric spells, using maximum power. The monster's battery was at 100% and about to explode like an overcharged phone. Stetch used everything he had 
but the monster didn't fall. Now he was in trouble. The manticore looked at him for a few seconds, then fell heavily to the ground. If he had been under the creature, it would have been a draw. Stetch focused on reaching the creature's neck as quickly as possible and didn't notice the monster's tail was about to strike him from behind. A powerful arrow prevented the tail from hitting its target. Elena watched everything carefully and wouldn't let the manticore do that. Stetch grabbed the shovel he had found earlier and would use it as a weapon. Hitting the spot where the dagger was near the monster's wing, he tore off the manticore's wing. The scream of pain could be felt even by him, and Stetch felt it in his ears. But the noise wouldn't stop him from continuing the attack. He drove the shovel deep into the hole where the monster's wing had been. The brutality left Memento and Elena speechless. Stetch fired a fireball into the hole, exploding the monster from the inside out. The impact sent pieces flying in all directions, including onto the veteran monster hunter, Stetch Atelier. Look at the size of the hole that became the area. The powerful attack also affected Stetch, so Elena ran to him with a healing potion. Memento had to acknowledge that it wasn't bad at all. His partner was proving to be an impressive warrior. Elena couldn't see Memento and didn't know of his existence, but she still had the same thought as the relic and praised her adventure companion. Stetch was incredible. He had won, but something felt strange. Elena and Memento asked simultaneously what was wrong. Stetch said the bodies this monster had eaten weren't here inside. Memento agreed that on the way here, they had seen many devoured bodies. This thing's stomach should be full to the limit. Stetch also thought about the egg. This manticore seemed to be male. At that moment, everyone's hearts pounded, and then a stealth attack surprised Stetch. A tail was about to blind our protagonist when Elena, in milliseconds, kicked Stetch out of the attack's path, saving him. Before he stopped sliding on the ground, Stetch warned Elena to watch behind her. The monster's tail had grabbed the girl by the neck and was ready to break it. In desperation, Stetch shot an air explosion, hitting the tail precisely and freeing the elf. That was close. Stetch should have known there were two due to the egg. This one was the female and much larger than the male. Moreover, it was much faster and stronger than the previous manticore. Its attack was so swift that he couldn't dodge it. Stetch was thrown toward the creature's tail, and this time there was no saving him. He was skewered like a kebab, right through where his heart should be. The pain of being impaled and the venom's acid corroding him was maddening. Seeing this, Elena should have gone into shock, but Stetch, still conscious, ordered her to retreat again. This was the manticore the informant had reported. Its wing was injured. Stetch used a fireball to attack the monster and free himself. <coughs> Despite having a hole where his heart should be and venom flowing through it, he managed to stand up. Despite his warning, Elena decided to come and cover Stetch while he recovered. Before she could do anything, the creature, with its speed, hit her from the side, breaking her bow and throwing her far from the scene. With the force of the impact, it was impossible to tell if she was unconscious or worse. Stetch's situation was critical too. He quickly took another healing potion and worried about Elena's state. Memento noted that she wasn't dead yet, but it wouldn't be long before before all three of them perished if this continued. The female manticore, furious over her partner, charged at him. This time, Memento took the lead, capable of casting spells for Stetch while his partner focused solely on attacking. Stetch had no choice but to attack and try to defeat it before being defeated. Using wind magic, he launched himself up and dodged the attack. Using the moment when the creature's vision was obscured by dust, Stetch had only one chance to do this. He descended, cutting the creature's bat wing, and before reaching the ground, he landed on the the monster's head, blinding it in one eye. Now, he needed an eye patch. The manticore retaliated, biting half his abdomen. Despite the pain, Stetch smiled, adrenaline flooding his body. The monster even tore a large chunk out of him. But before he could see the wound, the creature kicked the human away. Still lying on the ground, Stetch's abdomen was fully healed. This time, the human roared loudly, startling the monster. This prey was acting like a true, crazed predator. Elena opened her eyes, feeling pain all over her body. Remembering she was in a battle, she was startled by what she saw in front of her, a cautious manticore facing a wounded human. What Elena couldn't see from behind Stetch was that he was insane. Memento reminded his partner that their mana was at its limit. They had, at most, one more spell left to stay alive. Knowing this, Stetch handed his dagger to Elena and said he wouldn't last long. He needed her support now, and his life depended on it. The manticore watched its predator closely, and then suddenly, an electricity spell hit its back, running through its body. Stetch used everything he 
he had, and it was enough to knock the monster out for at least a few seconds. He just needed this time to get closer. Using his new max level weapon, he dug a hole in the monster's other eye, and then shouted for Elena to cut off the creature's tail now. Elena flew like a bird and positioned herself behind the creature. Using the blade he gave her, she perfectly severed the tail. Stetch used the powerful stinger against its own owner. He knew the manticore was the top predator in this place, and this was the most powerful weapon here. Stetch pierced the monster, hitting its heart, and killing it instantly. Finally, they had defeated it. Now, the question was, who was the true monster here? After some time, they returned to Baltazar's bar. Everyone was stunned by the situation. Just these two had defeated the manticore that the army couldn't. Stetch said not only that, but she had laid an egg, and he managed to take that too. Baltazar would receive a reward in exchange for the information, but the man insisted that the story he had to tell now paid the price. After all, this was what plagued the entire city and was resolved by the selfish explorer who wanted priority over the blacksmiths helping the army protect the city. The informant soldier was in the same place, drunk as always. Stetch approached him to return the belongings of his friends who had died down there. Stetch said that was all that was left of the soldier's remains down there. He wished he could have brought more. This comforted the man's heart. His cowardice that day tormented his heart every night, but at least he could take this to their families when he visited. Despite the sad situation, Stetch was happy to have helped someone on his adventures. That night, an alchemist visited the bar, having heard there might be a manticore egg there. Casper was amazed by the egg, while Letty was impressed by the creature's leather. Baltazar warned everyone that if anyone lost or damaged these items, he would personally drag the responsible party to hell. Stetch laughed at the excellent customer service, feeling at ease. Letty didn't know what Stetch had done to kill the creatures, but their hides were quite damaged. She knew that was the least of the problems when fighting a manticore, as it was only almost a miracle he had returned alive. Stetch agreed with her, saying that if he had worried about the hide during the fight, he would have died in an instant. Casper informed him that the bag on the table was the leftover money from upgrading his weapon. Stetch was surprised to see so much money left over. The blacksmith said his sword was in the workshop and should be ready by the next day, but the armor would take about three days to complete, even if they started now. The protagonist was shocked to hear this, as he believed it would take much longer to cure and tan monster hides, but Letty said only amateurs took that long. Elena arrived with a problem. She asked if there was any chance to repair her bow. Letty declined, and the protagonist assumed it was too damaged to be improved and would need to be remade. However, that bow was crafted with elven technique, so Elena wondered if something of the same quality could be made. Stetch apologized to her, as it was his fault her bow was so damaged. She was saddened because it was an old bow given to her by her grandfather, knowing it would eventually wear out. Memento appeared and agreed with her, making Stetch feel even more guilty about the destruction of such an important bow. The protagonist suggested they visit the blacksmith the next day to see if they could fix it. She thanked him sadly, wished him a good night, and went to her room to rest. Memento asked if he thought they could find something with elven craftsmanship. Stetch was so irritated he wanted to tell Memento to shut up while he thought of a way to help her. Meanwhile, Prince Gerald was commanding the soldiers to rebuild the defensive wall as quickly as possible before the next wave of monsters. Nothing was going according to plan. A soldier appeared and reported that Castle Brendan had made contact and that this time was different, making Gerald anxious. The person contacting them was Balstock, who asked how the prince was doing, which pleased Gerald as it came at the right time. He asked if anything had disappeared. Gerald became a bit anxious and informed the prince of a problem. Balstock asked if he remembered sending a task force to retrieve an artifact from a new dungeon a few weeks ago. The prince held his head, imagining they might have returned empty-handed, but the situation was worse. Balstock reported that he had sent a team to monitor them, and they reported the dungeon was in ruins. The prince was worried because this meant someone already had the artifact and wondered if his royal guards had betrayed him. But that wasn't the case, as all the royal guards were chosen from orphans with nowhere else to go and were all bound by a blood magic oath. There had never been a single traitor until now. Prince Gerald knew Balstock trusted his guards, so he didn't doubt their loyalty. But this wasn't just about an artifact. His dignity was at stake. He didn't know what his brother Alfred would do if he found out, so he instructed Balstock to find them as quickly as as possible. Back to our protagonist, Stetch, while having breakfast, asked about the number of weapon shops in the area. Baltazar mentioned that Stetch's girlfriend had gotten up early and left. After thinking for a moment, Baltazar warned that there were many strange men in the city these days, so Stetch should be careful. He threw the napkin at him, insisting she wasn't his girlfriend, and ran off to find Elena. Later, he arrived at the market, wondering where she had gone. He remembered he had never explained the value of money to Elena. He hoped she wasn't being taken advantage of, but 
memento suggested he not worry about her as she was more cautious than him. He overheard some people talking to a girl and turned to see Elena with a stranger. Suddenly, Stetch was startled by a loud noise. What he saw didn't surprise either the protagonist or memento. Just three men stood no chance against that girl. One man furiously charged at him with a dagger. But before he could strike, Stetch punched him, sending him crashing down hard, terrifying his companions. Elena didn't waste time and left the man with a broken skull, damaging some nearby walls. Stetch asked if she was okay, and Elena questioned if he was worried because she couldn't defeat that woman in the dungeon last time. Stetch was definitely not concerned for her safety, but rather the danger of her killing these men by overexerting her strength. Moving past this, he wanted to find a safer place. On the way, Elena wondered what he was doing there. He had come looking for her and asked why she had left so early in the morning. Elena explained that elves believed ancient valuable tools contained the spirit of their ancestors, and her bow contained her grandfather's soul. She was determined to repair it as soon as possible. Her words pierced the protagonist from all sides, making him feel even guiltier, groaning in pain. Memento was surprised to realize that the elf was much cleverer than he thought, as she was trying to make Stetch feel guilty. She was murmuring about burning the bows, although finding a sufficiently isolated place was difficult. Elena visited some shops but didn't have the courage to go in, fearing they might discover her elven heritage. Stetch understood what had happened and asked for some time, confident he could find a bow she liked, as promised. Memento laughed, thinking he might be joking, and wondered where he would find something to replace a bow that meant so much to her. Stetch told him to stay out of it, but his artifact did not take orders. Stetch called her over to check out one of the shops he found and they entered. He assumed that being a mining city, there would be all sorts of rare items available there and asked if anyone was around. Elena found some bows placed aside, and the protagonist was happy she found one she liked, which looked quite elegant. She commented that the wood of those bows was agonizing to be destroyed, and that their craftsmanship was poor. Hearing this, both Stetch and Memento were sure they would never find a suitable bow for her. The shopkeeper came out, apologizing for being busy hammering something, and asked if they were looking for anything specific. Memento asked to speak with Stetch before he talked to the shopkeeper. His artifact commented that while there was a lot of random junk, there were some rare items hidden there. The protagonist needed clarification on this, knowing that Memento saw things differently from humans. So, he asked his artifact what it saw. Memento was holding something that could be perfect for Elena but wondered what it was. Later, she looked at the weapon he had given her, and the protagonist was pleased she found a weapon she liked. Stetch was surprised by the idea of using a magical tool that a adapts to the user's mana. Elena thanked him for the gift and named the weapon Lecordacchio, which astonished him as she had already named it. The protagonist felt uncomfortable having put these cursed items in the store, and his body started to feel strange and heavier. He tried picking items that wouldn't attract attention, but Memento felt great absorbing the sweet scent of dark energy and death, making him seem worthy of being called a partner. But Stetch didn't like it at all. Elena asked when they would leave. Stetch explained that Letty said her equipment was ready, so they could leave as soon as they picked it up. Later, they left the city and soon were killing goblins, just as goblins slayer like to do, kicking them like soccer balls. Stetch was on alert when he saw a goblin chief and ensured that they were close to a village called Jialen. If that was the case, the chief in the village wasn't putting much effort into protecting the surroundings. He instructed Elena to handle the others while he dealt with the big one. She confirmed she had no problem and began punishing the nearby goblins. The goblin leader charged at the malicious human with his spear. At first, it seemed like he had hit him directly, but to his surprise, the human was tough. Stetch grabbed the spear, smiled like a villain, and suggested they speed things up. A few noisy minutes passed, leaving all the goblins in the area scattered on the ground, with Stetch absorbing the mana of their leader. Elena asked if their next goal was to teach a lesson to the corrupt lord of the village. Stetch replied that their aim was to help the villagers and cut off one of the royal family's sources of income. He told Elena about hearing something interesting from his friend Dalton. He revealed that a lord named Borden had started collecting tons of money, and what surprised Stetch was the rumor that the chief of Jelan was hoarding hundreds of artifacts in his personal vault. If this corrupt person had so many artifacts hidden in the city, he would be forced to share with our protagonist. They entered the village, where a soldier was taking a man's pig. The man begged them to let it go, saying his family would have nothing left if they took it. The soldier scolded him and ordered him to be quiet, saying everything they had belonged to the Lord, so he should stop complaining and hand over the pig. Elena looked furious, ready to use force to stop this cruelty, but Stetch held her back. He recognized it was wrong but instructed her to wait for now, as they needed to assess the situation. 
situation and not draw attention yet. The family man had his last animal taken as taxes and now couldn't feed his family. The two approached the man and offered him a gold coin in exchange for a place to stay if he didn't mind sheltering them in his home. They made a delicious meal for them, even though the guests insisted they didn't need to do so much. The man explained that things started to get worse a few years ago, initially raising the prices of public facilities like the water well. But since then, taxes had increased so much that they now had to give more than half of what they produced to the town leader. Additionally, the situation was so bad that the Lord didn't have enough supplies or money to leave the town. Stetch was speechless hearing the man's story. The people here couldn't save money and were indebted to the Lord of the lands, everyone trapped by debt. Elena was even more furious upon learning how the men treated people in these lands, even taking the farmers' lands if they couldn't pay the high taxes. The man added that even the town soldiers weren't spared and had their wages is reduced, making our protagonist think about how stupid the town leader was. By doing such idiotic things, he weakened the town's economy and security. After hearing everything, Stetch asked how the man knew so much. The man said the village bar was where you heard everything and got any information. Stetch remembered how Dalton always knew all the gossip from his town and the kingdom, and how the bar was where they should go. Later, the soldiers in the tavern were surprised because they had never seen Stetch before. They asked what his profession was, as he had just defeated a man in an arm wrestling match. Stetch laughed and replied that he worked here and there as a mercenary. The soldier was surprised to hear about the mercenary, sensing something different about him. One arm wrestling match was enough for the men to become friends, and the man offered him a drink on the house. While they were talking, the man was surprised to hear from the young mercenary that there were goblins near the village. The soldiers were supposed to keep the surroundings safe, but Stetch insisted he even encountered a goblin leader. In the end, the soldier accepted his words, but if Stetch had defeated them, they were safe again. Our protagonist mentioned he had barely escaped with his life. He even said only an experienced man like the soldier could handle that goblin leader. First, you beat a man in a test of strength and then recognize his strength and praise him. Just a few steps, and now the soldier respected him and started sharing his stories. After some mugs of mead and many stories and laughs, Stetch heard everything about the village and how the chief had a lot of money and bought all the artifacts he could. Stetch then revealed to the men that this was perfect, as he had an incredible artifact with him and was interested in selling it. The men's greedy eyes gleamed like politicians eager to embezzle money, making Stetch disappointed at how easy these idiots were to read. The man laughed and admitted that their chief would buy any artifact, even if it had fallen into a used toilet. If the young man took it to the castle, he would get a good price. He explained that these matters were handled by Grandmaster Chelsea. Stetch left the bar a bit tipsy. Elena remarked that he took a long time, asking if he got the information. Our protagonist felt embarrassed for making her wait so long. They talked a lot and drank too much, but he got the information. While walking, Elena commented that she didn't understand why humans liked drinking that bitter liquid so much. After some time, the elf mentioned they were being followed. Stetch picked up a stone, used an artifact to enhance it, and threw it in the direction of the person, showing he knew they were being followed. He simply ordered them to leave if they wanted to keep keep all their teeth. But instead of fleeing, they gathered to confront the outsider mercenary, shouting at him to hand over the artifact and leave the town. Before the man could say another word, Elena broke the soldier's teeth. Using her knee, she stomped on the man and jumped three meters into the air. Even Stetch was surprised, telling her not to attack people while they were talking. He even commented that he didn't know how he had managed to defeat her in the past. Memento made sure to mention that our protagonist only won because he was buffed by him. Before Stetch could join in to help, she had already broken the teeth of five soldiers. After a few minutes, all the soldiers were tied up. When Stetch saw the leader of the soldiers, whom he had befriended at the bar, he made sure to kick him in the face. He then approached the man, and asked how they had assembled this group so quickly to come after him. Was this all planned from the beginning? It seemed they had a habit of robbing people around here. But he asked, who is the boss organizing this? These idiots couldn't be capable of doing this on their own. He said he wanted the person's name right then. If he didn't speak in three seconds, his fingers would be the least of his worries. After much persuasion, the man didn't hesitate to say that the person responsible was Grandmaster Chelsea. This left our protagonist doubtful. But the man confirmed, it was Lord Chelsea who 
sent them here. He even explained that the Grand Master ordered them because Duke Borden had been spending too much money on artifacts, so they needed to replenish the town's funds. Stetch was embarrassed to realize that the men hadn't even thought about stealing for themselves. They were just following orders for this idiot. He then asked if they knew where this person kept the artifacts. Before the soldier could respond, the man from earlier intervened, saying they didn't know. He shouted that Lord Chelsea was very cautious about spreading his information. Not even a common soldier knew where the artifacts were. Stetch agreed that made sense, but the soldier from before shouted that he knew something suspicious. Near the chief guard's barracks, there was an unusual post. He mentioned seeing them taking a large piece of meat down there. Stetch quickly asked, What uses this information? I don't want to know about a pile of meat, the soldier replied. Are you dumb? How is this useless? If there's a large amount of meat being taken down there, it means there's a wild monster. This means the monster guards the dungeon or the place where the town chief stores his valuable relics. Then we are shown the chief of Jell and Borden. The man received a visit from the Grand Master named Chelsea. He came to ask if there had been a response from Prince Laptors. The town duke said he didn't need to be impatient. They should only worry about fulfilling the order, which was to increase the artifact collection for him. The duke explained that he was particularly interested in the latest artifacts they had collected, especially this last one, which was worth more than the other two combined. Borden said they had to send these artifacts for the prince to see personally. If everything went well, they would be set for life. He emphasized that Chelsea's job was to ensure nothing interfered during this time. Now, back to our dear explorer's house. He was staying at a villager's house and had hidden the guards he defeated last night in that house too, before executing his plan to steal all the town chief's relics. These people couldn't leave and reveal his presence in the town. So, he told them, if you don't make any noise, you can leave alive after I finish my job. Our protagonist then prepared some kind of potion while telling Elena they should get ready to infiltrate that well and get the town chief's treasure. If they were smart, there would be many protective traps in that well. Even though he didn't know exactly what was down there, the best way to get in was through the well itself. Elena had no objections but asked how he planned to enter that well without any guards noticing and how he would deal with the possible monster inside. While preparing a potion, Stetch said that the monster inside was definitely a living, biological creature. Since it ate meat, it was a carnivorous creature. All they needed to prepare was a special meal to keep it calm. While staring at the potion that would solve this part, he wondered. The problem now is getting out of there. How will I do that? He replied that in this situation, he would need Elena. She had to cause a distraction at the right moment so he could escape the place. He said she could use any method to draw attention, even throwing a meteor on the town. The important thing was to distract all the guards. After hearing this, she wasn't worried. He would go in alone, deal with the monster, and escape with the artifacts. This had to be very dangerous. She asked, Why can't I go with you? Am I just an obstacle? Is that what you're saying? Smiling, our protagonist said that wasn't the case. It was a two-sided operation. She was definitely important to help him escape while staying outside. Then he asked, Can you do that? With these words, she was very pleased while admiring her artifact and said yes, he could count on her for everything. At night, while our protagonist protagonist observed the place, he heard a noise that caught his attention. Looking closely, he saw it was a pig Elena had hunted and said it was a good job. It was bigger than he expected. He then took his dagger and said he would prepare the perfect meal for the creature by adding the potion he had prepared and cutting some pieces. Elena observed the place he would have to invade and said there were many soldiers there, asking how he could get past all of them, especially carrying such a large piece of meat on his back. The protagonist was almost done climbing the castle and regretted having to carry something so big. He climbed the wall but now had to pass unnoticed by the guards. Choosing a spot, he found the well the soldier had mentioned. Using his stealth, he entered the castle and then opened the well, from which a horrible smell came out. He said this was definitely from a monster, so there was a very large monster down there. Memento told his partner to be quicker and throw the food before the guards noticed his presence. While trying to throw a huge piece of pork down, he heard the familiar name Chelsea. A man approached, asking the guards if they were doing their patrol job well. Although they said nothing unusual was happening in the regions, he ordered them to increase security and stay more alert. Stetch hid and was barely noticed by the soldiers. With his heart still racing, he said this was thanks to his reflexes, which had increased with experience. Memento commented that the man was their chief and was even stricter. If they were ordered to increase security at this moment, it was because they were about to do something important. Stetch also didn't understand the point of collecting so many artifacts just to keep them stored in a room. They talked while Stetch was holding on at the well's entrance. He said that once he was sure the bait was taken by the monster, he would go down. After some time, he jumped into the well. He commented that his nose must be broken because he could barely smell the horrible odor he had 
smelled earlier. His thought was interrupted when he heard the breathing of something very big in front of him, a sleeping monster that he recognized as a Bernapa. Memento wondered how they managed to bring this monster from the swamps to here. Stetch said it was very interesting, showing that nothing was impossible if you had a lot of money. He passed calmly in front of the monster and said he had used a very large dose of sedative. It definitely wouldn't wake up for some time. Memento still didn't understand how they managed to keep this creature under control. What were the humans doing? After walking, Stetch reached a locked door. He commented that for a normal person, this would be an obstacle. But for him, there was no lock good enough that he couldn't open. It didn't take long before he was standing in front of a room filled with treasures. In all directions, he saw a lot of gold and jewels. More importantly, Memento told him to look further ahead. When he did, he was surprised because it was exactly what he was looking for. He checked the artifacts and saw that the dagger and the helmet were nothing special. They didn't compare to his Barak artifact on his wrist. Memento, almost drooling, told him to give them all to him to eat. Stetch did so, and upon consuming the two artifacts, Memento increased his capabilities. His mana limit went from 850 to 3250. His lightning ability evolved, unlocking a new skill called Tesla. Observing all this, a sort of system window, not much explored by us, appeared. He realized he was much stronger now, but there were still many abilities lock that needed much more mana than he could currently handle. This motivated him to become even stronger. He handed over two artifacts, but there was still one that was different. He tried to open the vial to understand what it was, but he couldn't. So, he decided to take it with him and study it later. After collecting as much gold as he could carry, since gold is very heavy, he encountered a now awake monster on his way out. Damn! The effect didn't last long at all. He grabbed his dagger and quickly stabbed the creature in the neck. Before he could execute an explosion skill, another monster hit him, throwing him far away. The blow was strong, dragging him several meters on the ground and even making him bleed from his mouth. He wanted to leave unnoticed, but it looked like he would have to fight this creature. Stetch prepared to cast a wind spell, but it was nullified, almost causing him to be fatally struck by the giant monster. He didn't understand what was happening. Memento said there must be dispelium embedded in these walls an impressive piece of work. Dispelium is an extremely rare material that nullifies any magic. It's used to make cuffs for wizards. This information made Stetch very angry, especially because it was extremely expensive. So, this is what the country collected so many taxes from the people for. Outside, Elena sighed. It had been a long time since he went in, so it was time. She activated her artifact and then shot arrows at the castle. She made a big bow this time and remembered this was Aida's specialty. Elena had no experience with large bows. Despite this, she successfully fired the incredibly powerful arrows at the castle. The impact was so powerful that the guards wondered if it was a bazooka. Elena, with her sharp vision, said she was about 500 meters away from them, so they definitely wouldn't notice her location in this forest. She then prepared to fire more and more shots. Soon, the entire fortress was trembling. The enemies announced they were under attack from an army. Dozens of bazookas were hitting the fortress. Chelsea, upon hearing there were enemies, began to sweat with worry. It's always at crucial moments that bad things can happen. He shouted for everyone to locate the enemies. But, as the soldiers observed, it seemed they couldn't react or defend themselves. One of the men on the wall noticed the shots were coming from deep in the forest. And shortly after realizing this, he was hit by one of the arrows. Chelsea shouted for them to enter the forest and find the enemy. It's just one person. Borden, realizing the attack, went to Chelsea to get information about what was happening. The man warned it was very dangerous to be outside. Someone in the forest was destroying the castle. They ordered the bridges to be raised so no one could enter the castle. Observing this, he said they couldn't stop her. her next shot perfectly hit the bridge chains, causing it to collapse to the ground. Even the girl was surprised by this attack power. It was difficult to control. While Elena caused chaos at the castle, deep underground, Stetch fought the creature. Unable to use magic, how could he defeat such a large monster? Memento, acting as an advisor, said that when they couldn't use mana, he was also affected by it. But that wasn't so bad. This was the perfect opportunity for Stetch. The protagonist was furious. How could this be perfect for him? Was he going crazy? Then, he remembered that Stetch had worked hard to get a new sword and armor. Was his partner an idiot after all? Motivated by his companion's words, he found an opening and attacked the creature from behind, stabbing the blade into its neck. Resilient, he then activated the gunpowder explosion embedded in his sword. Seeing the effect, 
Memento commented that this was what he was talking about. That crazy dwarf was able to make something this powerful? Stetch remarked that this could blow his arm off at any moment. The other Bernapa attacked quickly. He dodged the creature's attack by jumping to the ceiling. Using another ammo capsule, he prepared his dagger. When the creature had its back turned, he had the opportunity to attack again. But before he could get close, the monster quickly turned and roared ferociously at him. It had many teeth, its breath was heavy, and the sound was very loud. So, to create a new opening, he faced the monster, and when it attacked, he slid under it. Stetch used his sword and didn't need to use the explosion. The flesh underneath wasn't tough, and he cut the Bernapa's belly like butter. I presume even its privates were cut in half. Now he regretted not exploding and burning the monster, as he was covered in the stinking creature's remains. Even Memento acknowledged that his partner now smelled like sewage. Stetch would trade all the treasure there for a bath at that moment. He tried to use the curse-eating ability, but it didn't work due to the mana dissipating stones present. In this case, the Bernapa's mana would be wasted. Memento wondered how Stetch would carry so much gold up. It was too heavy to climb the well. This question made our protagonist think better. What should he hide now? He had already made a mess down here and up there. Elena must have caused chaos too. He said that, in this case, he would leave through the front door. All he needed to do now was find a way to get to the castle. Using a hidden lever, he pulled it and an elevator opened in front of him. This led him into the castle, which was connected to the town chief's castle. The protagonist hid as some soldier soldiers ran down the corridors, shouting that the castle was under attack and even the gate bridge was broken. Stetch, hiding, had no doubt that only Elena could cause such a commotion. Using his animal instincts, he analyzed the location of everything nearby that made noise. He knew where the stables were and heard the soldiers saying the enemy's weapon was arrows, but not normal ones, and that the bridge couldn't be closed. After that, he was sure it was Elena and decided his path. Jumping out a window, he headed to the horses. It didn't take long for the guards to see some someone without armor riding a horse while carrying a sack so large it might be heavier than the horse itself. Stetch managed to escape and decided to head straight for the village. During the ride, Elena joined him, asking if the plan worked. He said only half of it was done so far. The next part was to go to the city. She reminded him that they would be followed from all sides now. Did Stetch plan to fight the soldiers? No, he was just going to the village, and after some time, they arrived in the city. He asked Elena to stay hidden and do what he had asked when he gave the signal. Stetch prepared a large fireball and lit up the entire city with a flame so large it drew everyone's attention. Then he shouted as loudly as he could, Listen, citizens, this is your only chance. Leave this city immediately. Escape this oppressive regime. If you want a new beginning, use this and leave this city now. At Stetch's signal, Elena threw the sack, which must have weighed 2,000 kilos, into the air. Our explorer and outlaw used a wind spell to spread all the treasure and jewels throughout the town square. The man who took him in and all the villagers couldn't believe the absurdity of what was happening. Soon, Chelsea and his soldiers reached them in the city and questioned what the outsider was doing. Why are you spreading the treasure you just stole? You won't leave here alive, Stetch said a few words. I'm returning it to the owners. Unable to argue, Chelsea ordered the soldiers to kill the thief. Although he disliked Chelsea, Stetch knew these soldiers were just following orders, so he used his ice magic to immobilize them. For a few hours, they wouldn't be able to stop the townspeople from taking the scattered gold and escaping. This is a warning, said Stetch before fleeing. If the leader of this town continues as he has, his life will not be spared next time. And that was how Stetch made the town of Belen empty of inhabitants. The next day, they were far away, and the protagonist still hadn't managed to get rid of the bad smell on his body. Elena could hardly stay near him. After trying his best to get rid of the smell, how about using a perfume? He distributed all the gold to the villagers, but he brought this with him. He revealed to Elena that it was actually an artifact. The girl, upon inspecting the vial, managed to open it easily, which he didn't understand, as he couldn't open it with all his strength. Stetch took the vial and checked what the artifact's effect was by touching the liquid. When he discovered the effect, Stetch said Elena should keep it. Despite being an apparently important relic, Elena didn't accept it. Stetch then explained that it increased the physical abilities of the bearer and would be very useful for her. Even with the explanation, the elf girl wasn't happy. Memento then spoke in his mind, saying he shouldn't be so stupid about certain things. Ever since he met the girl, 
she had shown repulsion for cursed relics. Unlike magical artifacts, relics were something they remembered with sadness. Knowing this from Memento, he apologized to her, saying he wouldn't pressure her to accept something she didn't want. She was speechless, but in her mind, Elena remembered that despite being proud of her strength, she was weak compared to Stitch. Her magic didn't compare to his, and in physical combat, she had been defeated by other humans. Even her precious bow was destroyed because she wasn't strong enough. These memories weighed on her mind. What if she had been a burden to Stetch all this time? Elena then decided to ignore her anger at the relics and took the vial. Our protagonist had changed his mind about it, but Elena told him to shut up, and then she quietly said, If I'm expelled from my village because of this, You'll take responsibility for me. Those words, even the dumbest Stetch would understand the meaning. Tell me in the comments, do you know what this means? He then takes the entire bottle of perfume. Our protagonist asks how she is feeling. Is she okay? The girl responds that it is an artifact that enhances her senses and cleanses the impurities from her body. Its name is Amrita. Stetch says that's great. The effect should start soon. And just as he said, the artifact begins to spread on her arm first. Seeing the elf's face of suffering, Stetch remembers the time he assimilated with Memento Morton. For him it was like truly dying. But she must not panic. Everything will be fine. Elena simply collapses to the ground and passes out. Some time later, she regains her senses. When she opens her eyes, she feels her senses are overly sharp and her brain cannot process everything. Even her heartbeat sounds too loud and she can feel each grain of dirt on her fingers. Stetch notices that his partner has finally woken up. So, how does she feel? Are you tired? Can you control your artifact? Our protagonist was worried, but Elena says that her senses are very enhanced and that smell is killing her. Can he please stop stinking? While things are being resolved between the duo, we are shown the royal family again. The prince has received the letter he was expecting. Laptors is not satisfied with the information he received. To avoid repeating what he read, the prince hands the letter to his general, Mark McDowell, to see for himself. It seems that Noble, who was sucking up to the prince and promised to deliver very valuable artifacts, was robbed by someone. The prince says he doesn't mind the lost artifacts, only his image being tarnished because someone dared to steal something that was his. Mark asks if they should go after the thieves, and the prince says that's obvious. An offense to him is an offense to the royal family and must be punished. The prince whom our protagonist hates so much orders his general, Mark, to be responsible for tracking down this unknown person who is tarnishing the royal family's reputation. The man, holding one of the highest positions of power in the kingdom, accepts the mission to bring back the head of this person. Then, we finally return to our duo of adventurers. It seems strange, but the horse complains about being mistreated by Stetch, and somehow the animal feels superior to the human. After all, it is he who has beautiful legs warming his back. Elena, despite being blindfolded, can feel everything around her with her other senses. The elf has decided to deprive her eyes for now because her senses are too heightened for her to process. Since she can continue to travel even blindfolded this way, Stetch looks at the map to see the path they followed to their next destination. He chose the most difficult path possible to make sure they weren't being tracked. However, this path is worse than he thought from now on. They wouldn't be able to continue on horseback. Elena asks him to wait. She can feel something he doesn't imagine is nearby. Elena removes her blindfolds to confirm, its wings flapping and approaching. To confirm the girl's suspicions, Stetch activates his animal instinct to also enhance his senses. To his surprise, he detects nothing. So how can she hear that far? She explains that it's the roar of a monster and a faint sound of humans. She asks Stetch if he will save them. The protagonist says it doesn't make sense for soldiers to be in this forest. That means they are people who deserve to be saved. The problem is how to cross this bridge, and this fog is very dangerous. In that case, Elena tells him to step back. It seems the monster has noticed them. When Elena pulls out her bow, Stetch recognizes that it looks really cool. Even cooler is when the artifact's curse accumulates in her left eye. When her cursed artifact concentrates on her vision, the Sharingan comes into play, and her arrow seems to travel miles to the target. He wonders, did it hit? Just one shot exhausted Elena, and she said yes, and the humans also noticed. While Stetch was trying to see what was in the distance, Elena can't even stand up and almost collapses. Just one activation is very tiring. She needs to get used to it first. They then walk slowly across the bridge. They abandon the horse. As they walk towards the direction of the battle, at the site of the confrontation, the humans are injured. It doesn't even seem like they came out victorious. If it weren't for the external help, they would have died. While they were still treating the injured, 
the duo arrived at the scene. And what surprises Stetch is that unfortunately the group in trouble was that annoying guy. It didn't take long for that guy to call out to Stetch and say that this world is really small. They met again. Damn, Stetch thinks, what is he doing here? What is he planning? And the guy doesn't answer, he just says that fate is saying he should join his group. Stop resisting. Even if he refuses, he says he should at least join the meeting to find out what they are doing here, and that Stetch can help. He also greets Elena. He didn't immediately recognize her beauty due to the bandages and large coat. And after all, why is she blindfolded? Stetch seems to get annoyed with Memento because his artifact recognizes that Elena is better than him. It seems the girl is already mastering her artifact. Despite not wanting to do this, they follow to the camp of the thieves. They are camping here because the path ahead requires a bridge to pass. They are still building it. Stetch then asks what this has to do with fighting monsters out there. Then Garrett responds that they seem tasty and they need to eat to survive. Just thinking they would eat those monsters makes Elena nauseous. Are all humans that disgusting? Garrett knows that Brian Gosling doesn't want to go with him, but still, he insists on going to the group meeting to hear about their plans. Maybe he'll feel like helping them, and nothing like a good argument. He remembers that the bridge they need to move forward is destroyed. So, only when his group builds a new bridge, they can pass. The only way to cross the mountains is via a bridge or using a cave, which is very dangerous. Knowing that the only way is to build a bridge or go through a cursed tunnel makes Stetch curious about the cause of the bridge's destruction. Despite Garrett's arguments, Stetch does not agree, so the man asks for at least a favor from him. So, some time later, Stetch was using electricity to take down the monsters surrounding the camp. The Humangos are powerful beasts, and yet they were annihilated by Stetch's enhanced electricity magic. The poor monsters were destroyed so thoroughly that there wasn't even anything left to eat. Garrett, having seen the powerful magic before, was still amazed because this was even more brutal. What kind of training has this guy been doing for this? This magic is even more powerful than conventional electricity magic, but Stetch knows it consumes a lot of mana, so it's not something he can use freely. Elena says Stetch seems tired, doesn't he want to rest a bit? But in fact, he wants to test more abilities. He forms a concentrated shape of his electricity magic and asks Selena to inform the direction of the monsters. The elf, with her senses even sharper than Stetch's, says they are 400 meters to the right. Then, with a concentrated shot, he fires and hits the school of monsters flying towards them. The target was hit perfectly, but one monster survived. It screamed fiercely, causing Elena to suffer with her sensitive hearing. Unfortunately, among the monsters were some harpies. These creatures are much more powerful, and Garrett's group decides to help defeat them. However, Stetch yells for them to back off or they'll get hurt. When the protagonist prepares to make another electricity shot, Garrett yells for his companions to step back or they'll become barbecue. Stetch uses the full charge of his Arca magic, the Surge. A wave of electricity crosses the entire sky and destroys all the aerial monsters in front. This level of destruction was something no one there had ever seen in their lives or even knew was possible. Garrett, watching this, tells his companions that this is why he insists that this guy join them. After the magic, Garrett orders everyone to collect the monsters' bodies and help the injured. After using so much power, Stetch is a bit tired. Garrett even questions why he is making so much effort if he doesn't like him. He also says that the girl, from afar, the protagonist, is tired due to being stunned by the noise. So, the best thing to do is for them to join to rest, they don't need to help. And that was how two days passed. While they rested, Garrett's men managed to rebuild the main bridge. Garrett offers food as a reward. Thanks to the two adventurers, the monsters stayed away since then. Those things dominated the territory and were eliminated. Now this place will be safe for a long time. Garrett was explaining that they will be safe here for some time and can even charge a toll for the new bridge they built. Their discussion was interrupted when the little dwarf came to inform that their pursuers were spotted near this place. They did not expect this, so Garrett runs to the location to check if they are safe. They are not friends, but Elena asks if they should help. Stetch doesn't admit that he likes these people, but decides he will investigate alone. Elena should stay here and keep an eye on the situation. It didn't take long for the two to be watching from afar a caravan that stopped near the mountains. This group has been following them for a long time, and they've had countless fights while being hunted. And this time, it seems the group is bigger, with more mercenary soldiers. Judging by that flag, he recognizes whose soldiers they are. They hired a mercenary group called Drakes. 
They are powerful, so they won't be able to provoke them and run away. Despite everyone in the room recognizing the strength of this group, Stetch had no idea who those people were. Garrett explains that they are famous in the kingdom, especially their leader named Garrett. He is called the Dragon Destroyer or Dragon Slayer. This surprises Elena. A human managed to kill a dragon? The truth is that man never killed a dragon. It's just propaganda he created himself. But that doesn't mean he isn't really powerful. He then asks why that special name must have a reason. The explanation is that the artifact he carries with the dragon head is called Spiratus. It can shoot explosive bullets like a dragon's shot. Despite Garrett's words, Elena questioned why that seems impressive. For a moment, Garrett forgot he was talking to two monsters, but he argues again that it has infinite bullets, as it can eat stone and shoot explosions. Memento tells his owner that this is easy, that artifact is no big deal. Anyway, Garrett didn't convince the two that that man is really powerful, and so far they have only fled from that group. But now their plan is to defeat them. Stetch questioned if they are counting on his help. Garrett responds that of course, after all, Stetch is the strongest member of this group. Our protagonist never accepted joining this group, and questioned why Garrett can't infiltrate them and kill everyone. After all, they have the artifact that makes people invisible. Irritated, the man says it makes you invisible, and if it were possible to make other people invisible, they wouldn't even be here asking for Stetch's help. Memento, speaking in our protagonist's head, says the man is telling the truth. The ability to enter another astral dimension costs a lot for the user. Just one person would already be impossible. And it was only with this explanation that our protagonist understood why Garrett was so tired in the battle they had. If Stetch decided to help, Elena asks what they should do. Stetch questions if she would be able to defeat them. Everyone here shooting arrows. Although they are powerful, there are many obstacles to the location. If they are discovered, they will lose their advantage. Stetch then asks if the little dwarf can use that magic to make people sleep. Garrett explains that that man is not a mercenary for nothing. That kind of magic has no effect on them. His mercenaries wear armor with magical protection. After hearing all the things they can't do, our protagonist says he already has his plan. Garrett doesn't understand Stetch's plan because he talks about cages and making them run. Then we are shown Garrett's camp. There are kingdom soldiers and mercenaries who are celebrating. For them, each day alive is an achievement, so they drink until they sleep. The soldiers will stay on guard. It's very strange, but even Garrett's artifact deserves to eat too. It feeds on stones for pleasure. It seems this thing has an appetite too. The men's camp was peaceful. Then suddenly something almost pierced Garrett's head, an arrow from Elena almost ended the battle. The men realized they were being ambushed, so they shouted to search where the arrow came from. Before they realized, the weather was cold, and ice magic took over the whole place. They were stuck to the ground. Garrett doesn't understand who would dare to attack a fearless group like his. Elena aimed directly at the head, and even so, the man defended the surprise attack. This proves the dragon slayer is strong. Stetch, impatient decides the only way is to face them directly. Long distance attacks won't be enough. Garrett had to admit that Stetch has giant balls indeed. He can't even imagine what lies between them. Don't judge me. Those were the character's words, I didn't make it up. Garrett was surprised to see that the attack against his powerful group was being done by only two people. Now that the enemies appeared, he breaks free from the ice easily. He was just waiting for the enemy to think he had an advantage. What most bothered Garrett is that the mercenary was insulting, calling them bandits. But the man identifies himself as a righteous man helping the poor. Even Stetch agrees with Garrett that they are bandits. No need to try to deceive people. Garrett was completely confident in his victory against these two people. Stetch tries to attack them with his electricity imbued blade. It had no effect and he almost had his face crushed with a punch. The man didn't have the speed of the two thieves, so Garrett hit him from behind easily. But Garrett's defense made up for his lack of mobility. The attack was useless, and the enemy's counterattack was almost lethal. Luckily, he could enter the dimension of idiots to escape. I mean, the astral dimension. Garrett realized they were not just ordinary bandits, and was alarmed when he was hit by arrows. He was worried because there was another member, and assumed it was the same one who shot at him first. He wondered how they managed to get close to him like this. The protagonist ran towards him, aiming at the center of Garrett's armor. He attacked with his sword and pressed the release button, causing an explosion. Garrett coughed up all the food from before, worrying his soldiers. Stetch assumed the attack should have pierced through, but he was surprised, as Garrett backed off in time to soften the blow. 
The giant smiled and praised the protagonist's weapon, but now it's his turn to show his strength. The protagonist ran towards the mercenary soldiers, and despite being criminals, the man had genuine concern in protecting his soldiers. Garrett ran to attack the protagonist using his fists this time. Stetch tried to block and was pushed back, maybe breaking his arm. Before he could recover, Garrett ran again for an even stronger attack. Elena was worried because he was too close not to hit Stetch too with an arrow strong enough to overcome the armor. Garrett also didn't know how he could help in this fight without some attack strong enough. Memento recognizes that this Garrett is strong. He acknowledges his flaws and compensates with the right items and strategies. Stetch, even close to being crushed, told Memento to save the praise for when they defeat the enemy. The protagonist decided to try to block the artifact's blow with his sword with electricity magic. He was able to repel the attack, but it didn't cause any damage to the giant man. Then he wondered if his magic would work. He used the explosion ability and attacked, but Garrett absorbed the attack with his artifact. This shocked Stetch, as Garrett was a much more difficult opponent than he thought. Garrett reveals that he expected the man to have a magical artifact. He claims to have defeated countless people like Stetch. Garrett ran to attack him, but missed because he is very slow. The soldiers cheered for their leader, and despite the disadvantage, Stetch insists on the same attack. Even Garrett questioned if he is dumb enough to try the same attack that doesn't work several times. And despite being underestimated, Stetch was smiling. Garrett was ready to attack again, but unexpectedly, he fired his artifact at the ground, destroying the entire place's ground. And with that, the ice holding his soldiers was destroyed. All his men were free now. They were ready to join the boss in battle, but Garrett ordered them to stay out as it's very dangerous for them. Understanding their leader's words, the men retreated because they knew the man was ready to do something much more dangerous. The giant challenged Stetch again to continue the battle, and so the protagonist did, attacking directly with more speed. He didn't expect the man to choose close combat. Is it really a good choice to want to fight at close range? The closer he is, the farther he is from using his soldiers as a shield. Stetch, with his malicious smile, replied that this was what he wanted. Now his men are in his cage. Garrett didn't immediately understand what that meant, but soon the screams from afar made him realize what Stetch meant. All the soldiers were in shock on the ground, literally. They were well done inside. Garrett didn't realize another wizard was with them. The truth is, there's no other wizard, but Stetch's ability used on a large scale, creating a cage that hits anyone trying to leave its area. The weaker soldiers can't resist like Garrett and can't escape. Even Garrett found Stetch's methods cowardly. This bastard is the true villain here. Now that they can't escape, what remains for them is to try to help their boss in combat. This explains how Stetch wanted to make a cage. Now, Garrett comes into action and, with his artifact, defeats the weaker mercenaries. Garrett feels weak dealing with these wimps while Stetch faces the real boss alone. Even Elena, who is distant, can handle the common and weak soldiers. For Garrett, it's even more surprising to realize that the woman aims directly at the joints. It's not just the boyfriend, she is also scary. After a few seconds, all the soldiers were defeated, and one was taken as a hostage. Garrett was furious and questioned if they had no dignity. How can they fight so dirty? Stetch even gets annoyed hearing these words from a mercenary. A life and death duel has no rules, and dead people can't complain. He prepares to cast his wind magic, and Garrett repeats that magic has no effect on his magical armor. Despite all Garrett's confidence, this attack has a great physical power, and even his strong armor doesn't block the powerful impact. Garrett now realizes his opponent was conserving energy before, that wasn't his most powerful attack. Stead shouts that now he got him, then Garrett helps and attacks directly the giant dragon slayer. The combined attack's force throws the man against the wall. At this moment, Garrett wonders, who is this guy? That magic is more powerful than a traditional wizard's. The man's armor was broken. Garrett then decides he can't hold back anymore. He will use everything he has now. Before he realized, one of the black spheres was above him and hit him powerfully with the electricity magic. Garrett can't help but be impressed with Stetch. Even so, Garrett, burned like barbecue meat, was still standing, but the sword would deliver the final blow. Facing his last moments, Memento shouted in Stetch's mind, dodge that now. A shot almost took a piece of his ear, and then exploded in the background with deadly energy. This firepower goes beyond what they told, that's why he didn't use it, for sure it would kill his companions. Now on the brink of death, that's no longer a concern. Garrett was shooting in all directions hoping to hit the enemies, or cause the most damage possible before dying. Stetch didn't count on that, this way he has no way to counterattack. 
While the two men didn't know what to do, suddenly a green light hit the dragon's head. Garrett, curious about what that was, had only a few seconds to realize it was an arrow blocking the cannon. The explosion was so powerful that it must have burned the hair of everyone near the place. Of course, the responsible was Elena. Only the girl could hit an arrow with such precision. After the defeat of the mercenary leader, only the rest of the troops were left, who were like trash compared to the trio. And so, they were all eliminated the next day, after a long night. The people were working to repair the destroyed things, and Stetch stayed up all night on watch. Elena questioned why he was making so much effort, and even denying to admit, he wanted to help these people, the bandits who robbed the rich from the royal family, and distribute to the poor of the kingdom. Stetch and Elena were called to Garrett's tent. He was very grateful and also wanted to show something important to Stetch. Something that was kept, then he places it on the table. It was simply Garrett's artifact. It turns out that Stetch had donated this to them, but the man refuses. He says he doesn't deserve the merit of having this, it's Stetch's. The only reason is that none of his men can use this artifact. To demonstrate, Garrett uses the artifact. It changes appearance and size depending on the user. The point is that only Garrett, who had a powerful physique, could withstand the rebound of this thing. Anyone else would lose an arm. Stetch had no intention of using something like this, as it doesn't suit him, but Memento suggests to his selfish partner to offer it to Elena. The protagonist even asks why Memento is being so generous with her. Memento explains that this is an investment. Stetch, as his partner, will have more chance of success in his mission if he makes this girl even stronger to support him. It's not charity, it's an investment. And if so, our protagonist offers it to Elena. He makes her take the gauntlet while holding her enchanted bow, and as expected, it adapts to her body, so she can use the relic and hold the enchanted bow. Garrett acknowledges that Elena is stronger than all of them, and can use this to strengthen her shots, and use as a shield because the item is resistant to magical attacks. Stetch then accepts the gift and questions, what are these papers and maps on Garrett's table? These things were in Garrett's possessions. Stetch then realizes they are direct orders from the royal family. This crest is unmistakable. Garrett was specifically a client of Alfred Messer, one of the kingdom's princes. The information was about an escort mission of supplies on the northern front of the country. The information here is about the route of the supply wagons. There are 35 industrial-sized wagons going from the south to the north of the country. Given the importance of this cargo, Stetch soon thinks it would be a great loss for the kingdom and Garrett if he could harm that guy with this, he will try. The protagonist then questioned how long they would take to reach the location to intercept these wagons. Garrett assumes the only way is to intercept them in 20 or 25 days at this place in Lysia Canyon. Despite the question, Garrett didn't expect Stetch to suggest they take all these supplies. Stetch even says if Garrett owed him, this is the chance to pay his debt and still make a profit. They can make this straight and intercept the wagons and steal all the supplies. This would be perfect, no mistake. Despite knowing this is bad, it's an exaggeration. Garrett accepts, but says that according to the map, it seems the distance is short, but it's immense. They wouldn't reach in time if they went around the canyon. The only way is to go through the underground dungeons. However, the risk is even greater, as they would face much more powerful monsters than harpies and humangos. Garrett's words had the opposite effect on Stetch. He became even more determined to defeat all the dungeons that exist on the way to the location. This makes Garrett rethink if this lunatic won't end up killing all of them. So, after some time, Stetch was in front of a dangerous dungeon that crosses the canyon. This dungeon is rank S and its entrance emanates a terrible energy. Stetch thanks the man's guidance and heads to the cave's entrance. Memento comments that it's probably one of those death worms that is the boss of this dungeon. Even though they saw the cave's entrance from afar. Until they reach the entrance, there are a lot of obstacles. Stetch was even discouraged by the work it would take to cross all this. However, a strong explosion caught his attention, and when he went to check, Elena had the ability to destroy all the rocks along the way. Memento admiring says that's what a true archer is. I say more, these are the curves a beautiful archer should have, like those of Olympic archers. You comment if they are amazing or not, and subscribe to the channel please. If you do, I'll send a waifu to you by mail. Please subscribe to the channel.